We now go to AEW Dynamite, also February 5th, 2020. John Moxley versus Ortiz with Jericho and Sammy Guevara on commentary. So the nitpick here is like a minute. What? This I got to hear. There's a point where Moxley's running the ropes and Santana is supposed to trip him from the floor. And Santana forgot to trip him. And Mox stopped running anyway. Well, maybe he got his foot cut on that rope. I hadn't thought of that. Perhaps he just actually slipped. Sure. Legit. Okay, that's my nitpick. This was so good. I love this whole segment. Ortiz is a hero. Ortiz is awesome. His afro is back. Moxley is awesome. Moxley is great. Santana is awesome. We'll get to him later. So, Mox makes a comeback. Well, first, before we get to the match itself, let's talk about Jericho okay. and Sammy on commentary. All right. Jericho explains that this is not a gimmick. So he says, a gimmick. These men are legitimate street thugs. Yes. He says, John Moxley, this guy's a genius in the ring. He's one of the best in AEW. But he was completely insane to turn down our offer, and thus he's an idiot. Fans are going nuts. Yes. Jericho says, Sammy, I have advice for you in life. Don't ever be nice to anyone. <laughs> what was his advice? <laughs> and then Sammy said, let me write that down. Yes. Listen to Craig. Don't ever be nice to anyone. And then later, Jericho, when after the match, and Santana attacked Moxley, Jericho's, his literally, he just says, never turn your back on the inner circle. Because he is a bad guy who does not think that he's a good guy. No. He is a bad guy that knows he's a bad guy. You, you never be nice to anybody. And motherfucker, if you turn your back, I will jump you from behind. No, no, don't That's the anyone. kind of fella I am. We cannot be trusted. Yes. And as we'll get to later in the show, he's also a massive hypocrite. Oh, of course. An unapologetic hypocrite. So what I was going to say was maybe five minutes into this show, not even the match, five minutes into the show, the, the former LAX, the proud and powerful, are on the floor uh, uh, having a meeting, and Moxley goes for a tope, and Santana takes the bullet for his partner, gets wiped out. And then Moxley dumps to his feet and goes for Ortiz, who is in the match, and just throws him into the crowd. And the whole place is on their feet and screaming and chanting Moxley, Moxley, Moxley. And I watched these two shows back to back like most of you, I think. And like five minutes in, the show was more lively and more fun and seemed more relevant than anything on NXT. It was all great. So they have a very good opening match. And then the finish is Santana gets in the apron to ch- try to cheat. Ortiz charges. Moxley dodges. Ortiz knocks Santana, t- Santana off the apron. Easy for me to say. Ortiz is horrified. He gives a scare look into the camera. He turns around and Mox grabs him, hits the paradigm shift for the win. Great opener. Then it's revealed that Moxley wrestled that entire match with the car keys in his pocket. The uh, the keys to the Ford Mustang or the Ford GT, whichever. I'm not a car guy. Then he takes the keys. He indicates he's going to jab them into Santana's eye. Jericho sends Sammy and Jake Hagar to break it up, but they are too late. What kind of car did you say? A Pontiac? Did I say Pontiac? Ford, what do you say, GT? What do you say? I said Ford GT. It's a $750,000 car. Yeah. I don't think it's a Ford GT. Anyway. So Moxley jabs the keys into Santana's eye, runs away, and then the crew, by which I mean both the inner circle and the attendants in AEW, spend several minutes tending to Santana's eye. This is not a... Uh, this is not a to-the-back moment. This is a severe injury this man has suffered when another man jabbed a car key into his eyeball. That's right. It was revenge. Not only was it revenge, but it was revenge using the heel's car keys. Yes, actually, it was his own car keys. That's true. It made it even better. All right. Tonight on this show, Cody takes his 10 lashes from MJF. Britt Baker faces Yuka Sakazaki. An eight-man tag, the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega and Hangman Page. Ah, God, the Ford GT is about $500,000. Versus the Butcher and the Blade and the Lucha Brothers. And up next, SCU versus Best Friends. It is, in fact, SCU versus Best Friends. It's 2020, and I'm watching a a national wrestling show listening to Jim Ross critique a headlock. Kazarian's got a great headlock, he says. He uses his headlock very well in recent weeks. That's his job. It's very wacky. Big train wreck spot outside. So Orange Cassidy joins in, just walks over, lays down. So the key is, the best friends, they're not a total joke. But at the end of the day, they are a comedy team. 
So they have this match won. They have SCU at least, at the very least, they have them on the ropes. And rather than go for a finishing move, they stop to do the big hug, and everyone cheers. And Excalibur screams, you got to give the people what they want. And Ross is scolding them for taking their eyes off the ball, not getting the job done. And he was right. He was exactly right. They go over their finish. It gets foiled. And then SCU is a super kick slash sunset bomb combo for the win. They are then immediately jumped by the Dark Order. Orange hits the ring for a face-off of the Dark Order. They offer him a mask. He declines, to make a long story short. So they kill him. And I do mean kill him, because at one point Jim Ross said there was brain splattering. Wow. I don't remember seeing the brain splatter. That's a lot of... Is Orange Cassidy... I got my one nitpick. It's not even really a nitpick. It's just... This guy, they consider a loser... This guy's got the best gig in the company. He does. <laughs> so they are stopping him when Chris Daniels runs out. And as soon as he hits the ring ready to fight, they all back away. Mm-hmm. Fans chanted Fallen Angel. He did. I think everyone thinks it could be Chris Daniels. And it could be Chris Daniels. Very well could. We have an MJF video on the 10 lashes. He vows Cody's going to quit. He will not make it through all ten lashes, and thus he will not get them after the MGF he wants so badly. So, I mean, it should have been self-explanatory because if I say, Rob, in order to get your beer bash, I have to whip you with a strap ten times. If he comes over for the strapping and I strap him one time and he's just like, I'm not taking another one. I mean, he doesn't get his beer bash, right? Apparently, so yeah. it should have been self-explanatory, but they never really explained it until this show which I think they should have done earlier. It doesn't matter. It was still great. But this show, they decided to hammer home that fact. It's not just the stipulation being he has to take the 10 lashes, but he must take all 10 lashes. If he quits, the match is off. Taz is talking about this. So it's going to be tough to watch, unpleasant to watch. Max is taking things a little too far. That made me laugh. Taz and Max are on a first-name basis now. Well, that's his name, Max. It shows how badly Cody wants a match with MJF Revolution. So, Britt Baker is going to face Yuka Sakazaki. The match, or not the match, the entrance begins, and Jim Ross turns to Excalibur, and the screen says, Yuka Sakazaki in giant letters. And Jim Ross says, tell us about Yuka Sakazawi. <laughs> well, maybe he's got bad vision. It's his gimmick now. Couldn't read that. Uh... Now then, he turns this around by referencing Barbara Eden in 2020. That's a fairly dated reference. And then it hit me. I know there's a war going on, and two sides of a war rarely make agreements. But they really do need to trade Jim Ross for Mauro Ronaldo. That ain't going to happen. Because Jim Ross is out here talking about Barbara Eden and headlocks. He's the guy who should be calling the show that's watched by all the over 50 people. Well, yeah. And Mauro were... should be out here calling the video game matches. So I want to make one more comment about the 10 lashes stipulation. I don't think that you need to treat your fans like idiots, but I do think that it's okay to explain something, even if, when you think about it, it should be obvious. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Do you have a specific example in mind, or are you going to No, that one right there. Like, if you think about it, obviously, if Cody quits on the third lash, he doesn't get his match. He's going to get 10. But they never explained it before. And, And simply by explaining it, like, it makes the whole thing... Well... Even more dire for the guy, ex- even though you know it's dire going in. By explaining it, it's actually very... You know what? It is very important, because explaining that if Cody quits before he gets a 10, then it doesn't count the matches off. Now, there is suspense. Before, it was just, he's going to get whipped 10 times, and that's it. Now it's, can Cody survive 10 lashes? Yes. Which is a totally different story, and a yes. vastly superior one, by the way. So, this match goes two minutes, and Yuka wins with the cradle. Britt attacks her uh, afterwards with the ring bell. She wraps her mouth around the rope and stomps on the back of her head. And Yuka comes up spitting up teeth. And then Britt puts her in locked jaw for good measure. The only way this part could have been any better, she should have left a business card. Hey, that's what I thought. She's, she's getting, a dentist. She's getting patience. Yes. I hope this, this show, uh, one thing about the ratings for this show, we don't have the quarters that I know of, but... Uh, a lot of people watching with their families. I think it was 1.42 mm. or something viewers per home, which is 
like the highest of any wrestling show in a long time. Like a lot of a lot of friends, family were watching together. I hope kids weren't watching. It's hard enough to get them to the dentist. This is the last thing they need to see. Thank God I just got back from the dentist. Butcher and Blade and Lucha Brothers versus the Young Bucks and, and Kenny Omega and Hangman and Page. What a great match. What a great segment. What a great match. So the Elite comes out to the Being the Elite theme, but Page still comes out by himself. He heads straight to the ring while his quote-unquote buddies are all yucking it up on stage doing wacky poses and dances. So the first, like, for the first 10 minutes of this match, Hangman Page is not in at all. The first five minutes of the match is his buddies having fun and doing wacky double and triple teams all by themselves and completely ignoring him. He is shunned. Now, finally, they get the heat and Omega, and at least something is going on. They're not just making him look like a total fool. There is a spot with the Lucha Brothers, Kenny Omega, and Matt Jackson. It was very, very convoluted, and it felt like at any point the entire thing may fall apart. Somehow it never did. They pulled it off. It was long and complicated and erratic, and eventually it worked. So I think it was like eight minutes, or it's eight minutes in, and it's a good eight minutes, when Hangman finally gets his hot tag, and as soon as he hits the ring, he is so clearly the star of the match. And it's like you were talking about how it's going to be a challenge now to turn him. This story has worked too well. They wanted his his motivations to be so obvious and clear that the fans would understand why he would be turning. But they're so obvious and clear, instead they relate to him. And they like him. Well, he's just not going to turn. I mean, not for a while. So, eventually, the heels come back. They run run wild four on one. Uh, it's back and forth for a bit. The Bucks make their comeback. They shout for a super kick party. But then Paige tags himself in and chaos ensues. Chaos ensues. Page is in there going for a while. He 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 hits a follow a slam on the butcher, but then does the kip up, but sells his knee, which he had tweaked earlier. And the Bucks are like, "Hangman, hey tag us in." Hangman hey sells his knee, looks at them, waves them off, goes in for battle. He's immediately hit with a sling blade and the penta driver with a foot stomp, and he is pinned. He oh. is victim of his own pride, yes. his own cowboy pride, his hubris, his arrogance cost him. And his friends, by the way. For all their work, they were losers, too. Just all sorts of excellent TV in this, this segment. So Tony Schiavone is about to interview Kenny Omega after the break. But before he can start, we go backstage. Pac has taken over. Uh, there is the is, Was this Lexi, the interview gal? Yes. Yes, this is Lexi, and Riho is also there. And I think it was the first time I mentioned on camera, or suggested on camera, that Kenny and Riho have a relationship. So Pac says he's done... He, he, this was supposed to be a contract signing. He couldn't get Kenny's attention. Clearly, Michael Nakazawa means nothing to you anymore. Now let's see how much you care about Riho. You can stop this whenever you want, Kenny. You just have to accept. So Kenny, in the ring, grabs the mic, frantically, frantically accepts. I accept, I accept, I accept. Pox a C, that wasn't so hard. And Kenny, I would never put my hands on a woman. I'm a bastard, but I'm not a beast. But she is. And he gestures over her shoulder. Nyla Rose, the native beast, attacks Rio, picks her up, tries to power bomb her through a table, but she's just too small. The table won't break. And Nyla screams, next week your ass is mine. This- so, I didn't dislike this. There was things I liked about it, but it was weird. So, Kenny's in the ring, and Tony's going to interview him. And they cut backstage... And Pac is standing there at a table with a contract on it. And he says, this was supposed to be a contract signing, but you ruined it. And I thought, what? I don't know where that game part came from. <laughs> like, no, That's- what happened here? Did Pac go and just like set up his own contract signing and didn't alert Kenny? Was there supposed to be a contract signing and Kenny no-showed it? What? Well, did was it scheduled to be when the mat? What in the world happened here? This was the weirdest story. That part I don't get. Okay, <laughs> so I was just I was flummoxed. I mean, like, said it was supposed what to be the fuck signing. is he talking about? Where is Kenny Omega? Was this supposed to be a contract? Well, Kenny signing? was in the ring, or is, or is Pac just like going into business for himself? I'll get a table, a bastard table. 
and I'll get a piece of paper and I'll make him sign this contract. So then they did the Riho thing and and that was that. The only thing I didn't like about it was Pac goes, clearly you don't care about Michael Nakazawa. I, it was like they did that to make me mad. So if you recall, Pac, like a month and a half ago, he snuck into Michael Nakazawa's room and closed the door. Mm. That's the last we heard of it. I don't know what happened. I don't know if there was a violent beating. I don't know if they discussed stock prices. I don't know what happened. So then, if I recall correctly, like a week or two later, Michael Nakazawa was like just on TV. It's fine. And then two weeks after that, they shot the angle again where Pac is going into Michael Nakazawa's office or he leaves him laying or whatever. I'm like, can you show or tell me what the fuck's going on with Michael Nakazawa? Because I have no idea. So that's it. This Michael Nakazawa thing. Did he beat him up or not? What happened? We have a Darby Allen video. Uh, it was amazing. He is alone. Have you seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? I have, yes. Oh, well, well okay, yeah. Like, that, is That's that what this is. The idea? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this is better. <laughs> this is more, better and more satisfying. Darby Allen, he is outside and he's in the dark. And he's trying to talk, but he can't. It just makes raspy voices and grabs his throat. And in case you forgot or missed it, they show last week where Sammy Guevara jabbed a skateboard into his larynx. So this is why he can't speak. So instead of speaking, Darby Allen turns and looks over his shoulder. And there is a cardboard cutout of Sammy Guevara and Chris Jericho embracing. And also conveniently a big leaf pile in front of him. And then... Because we needed something flammable. Yes. Well, yeah, it makes a better visual. And then Darby Allen... I'm not making this up. Darby Allen pulls out a flamethrower. Do all skateboarders have these? And this is news to me. Uh, where do you get a flamethrower? Darby Allen has a flamethrower. <laughs> you get flamethrower prices now? Look on Amazon. <laughs> Darby Allen uses his flamethrower to ignite the cardboard cutout of Sammy Guevara and Chris Jericho and the leaf pile so there's more to burn. There's a huge blazing inferno and that's it. <laughs> Resume all departments. Let's see. Well, there you go. Uh, Red Dragon, Weed Dragon, Backpack, Propane, Vapor, Torch Kit with Squeeze Valve. That sounds like kind of a flamethrower, right? It does? Well, not like the one he used. Flamethrower. Uh, That's a song. There's something called the Boring Company that sells something they call not a flamethrower. Oh, it's a oh, fire extinguisher sold separately for exorbitant amounts of money. This may be a joke site. <laughs> I mean, here's Trenton Gifts Propane Torch for Killing Weeds Small Flamethrower. I think it was a little bigger than that one, though. Here's one on eBay. Throw Flame XL18 Flamethrower, legal to own. 110 foot range. I don't know if that should be legal to own. <laughs> That's a bad thing for the general public to have. Where can I get a flamethrower? Uh huh. I should have known. Throwflame dot com. XL. Oh, that's a big fucking flamethrower right there. The XL eighteen next level firepower. It says unrivaled performance. Our flamethrowers deliver the power, performance, and safety to set even the biggest challenges up in smoke, like the inner circle. Unlock the true performance of your flamethrower with our fuel-thickening napalm mix. You can get napalm? Just like over-the-counter? Each flamethrower is designed for years of hard use. (laughs) And there are, in fact, flexible payment options. Oh, good. Well, speaking of flexible payment options, Brian, this is not a flamethrower, but it's fire-related. It's a fire drone, an octocopter, octocopter, it says, for tall building fires and forest fires, I think it's a camera included, so it's like for scouting fires. One hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Well, hey, this XL eighteen flamethrower, five stars by the way, three thousand one ninety nine, starting at one ninety nine a month. If oh. you want to shoot, if they can afford four to four GT, they can afford a flame. One hundred and ten foot plus range, 0. 0.5 gallons per second, and napalm compatible. There's a video. 
That's definitely a flamethrower. Nay palm. <laughs> Napalm cinnamon whiskey. Muscle the wand system has been napalm. completely redesigned to handle a 10 time increase in firepower. Easy push button ignition. High strength heat shroud. Ergonomic grips. Very important. And a high power pilot torch. That thing's no joke. Yeah, I don't think I don't think you can buy napalm, at least not online. Okay, so Jim H here, very the dark owner. web. Do you have the dark web on here? The XL18 is awesome. It's just as much fun to use as it looks in the video. Easy to to reload with spare CO2 cylinders. Don't take too many friends out with you because all you'll hear is, "Can I be next?" Well, I won't lie. Daniel B, a verified owner. <laughs> I wanted military grade, and I got it. Best seven seconds of my life. A wow. pressure regulator would be great, and the payment is easy to use. Get one if you are awesome, and while you can. <laughs> the best seven seconds of my life. Huh. Brian S., verified owner. It's the most awesome weapon slash toy slash tool I have purchased. A real rush to use. Tool? Well, uh, theoretically, the, the, the only practical use for a flamethrower is clearing brush. Which would make it a landscaping tool. This person says, Mark K, verified owner. Anybody can get an AR-15. But if you really what? want to go big, you need to throw flame. I am happy with my XL-18. There you go. Okay. Vinny, you learn something new I, I def- every day. I definitely did today. I learned a lot today, actually. I had no idea. Kip Sabian versus Joey Janela. The classic example of a match that would have been much better half as long. <laughs> I was just looking at some of the facts here. What are flamethrowers used for? Ground clearing or controlled agricultural burns. Mm-hmm, yeah. Ice and snow melting and clearing. Well, it would work. I was thinking a couple couple weeks ago, and there was snow on my well, driveway. Get the flamethrower! <laughs> Funny story, Brian. That Sunday night, when we got the big snow, we got like a foot of snow. I don't think I ever talked about it on the show. Uh, we, I was taking the garbage out when I got home that night, and my hands were cold and wet, and they went like this, and my wedding ring went flying off my uh, hand into the snow. You shrunk. Yes, actually I did. And so the next day, I, I tried to find it. It's night and still snowing. Couldn't find it. The next day, I'm out there with like a, a broom. I was trying to sweep away the snow, trying to find where it went. A neighbor suggested using hot water to try and melt snow. So I'm like carrying buckets of hot water to my sink for like for like two hours. I never found. I never did find it. Why don't you just wait for it to melt? It's not going well, anywhere. Because I live in an alley, and the, where I dropped I it, see. where I dropped it, or where it fell off is actually where cars drive by. Mm. So I was worried a car would drive by, we got stuck in the tires, and never, I would never see it again. True. Now, a week passed, and just as Bridget and I were headed out of town, the snow did melt, and she did in fact find it. So I, so that happened, and then uh, we had our early Valentine's Day uh, uh, celebration last night because she's going out of town on the fourteenth, and so for Valentine's Day, she did in fact gave me a wedding ring that fits. Oh, wow, look at that. Very very fancy. Thank you, dear. Wow. So, yes, I'm still married, everyone. So, Kip Sabian and Joey Janela, for like five minutes, it's great. And they did not start with a lockup, these two guys fighting over a woman. They were just beating the hell out of each other. And Penelope is interfering. She's slamming Joey's head into the stairs. And Sabian tries to dive, but Joey dodges it and hits a German on the floor, makes his big comeback, and everything's going fine. And after a while, the crowd just gets tired. They well, quite frankly, it went a little too long. They didn't turn on it or anything, but they were just not into it anymore. And it, was, it went a little longer than it needed to. And finally, Kip is selling. So Penelope gives him the big reviving kiss. Joey charges. He accidentally knocks Penelope, Penelope off the apron. Very similar to what happened in the first match, actually. Penelope goes flying, but Sabian rolls Joey up, hooks the tights, gets the pin, and then checks on his girlfriend. And that's the end of that. Alex Marvez tries to interview the inner circle, but before he can even ask a question, Jericho interrupts and takes over. What kind of trash spikes a man in the eye, he asks. <laughs> He's going on about how terrible this is, what a dastardly deed this was by John Moxley, and then Santana takes over. God, Santana's awesome here. 
This was the worst month of my life, he says. He says it's no secret it's the worst month of his life. I have no idea what happened. So I'm sorry you had a bad month, Santana. But Moxley, you threw gas in the flames. You brought out a side of me I didn't want to bring out. Keep in mind the guy saying this on camera is a self-described thug. <laughs> With one eye. With Now he's got one eye. Next week, he says, I take you on a walk through the dark. Next week, eye for an eye. This is great. This whole segment was awesome. Yes. <laughs> Lexi starts to interview Hangman. Oh, this is the greatest. All these promos with Hangman are great. So Hangman's got a beer in his hand because he's constantly drinking. Yes. Okay. So the Bucks rush in. They're screaming at him. He's, they're, they're, the, the key is she asks a question, but before he can answer, the Bucks interrupt to scold him. Sure. Because... But I'm trying to figure this out now, because they're screaming at him for not making the tag. Yes. No, he made a blind tag. That was a problem. Well, but he would not tag out. I see. He was telling his name. That's right, yes. He said tag us. He said no. He says, I tried. Well, that's a lie. That was definitely a lie. So then Matt says, I was going to ask what your problem is, but I think I know what the problem is. And he grabs the beer, and he takes it out of his hand, and they walk off. And the camera zooms in on the hangman's face. And if you've ever watched WWE, this was the beginning of that. They're just going to zoom in on his face for an uncomfortable length of time. All right? But there's a big difference. There was a payoff. In WWE, they zoom in on someone's face, and they're just like, if it's the interview woman, she's just smiling happily. Like, I got a good one out of that guy. They zoom in on Hangman's face, and he has real emotion on his face. He has a look has on his loss. face yes. of a man. It's, it's loss, but it's also the realization that, my God, I do drink a lot. I, maybe I do have a problem. Maybe they're right, and I do need to do something about my drinking. That's what you see in his face. And then suddenly... He produces the biggest fucking pitcher of beer you've ever seen, and he just starts chugging. The fans went fucking crazy. Because it was awesome. This was so great. It was unbelievably great. I loved I loved it. I loved it because Hangman was so good at making you think that he thought that he had a problem. That's what made this so great. Mm -hmm. It wasn't they took his beer away. If it's WWE, it's like they take his beer away and then they focus on the guy and he pulls out a bigger beer. It'd be just like, you know, simple, idiot-proof comedy. This was much better. Because I doubt this had anything to do with anything, but there was like a big threat on our board. Like, is the storyline that Hangman's an alcoholic? And if it is, like, that's going to be interesting because there's going to be a portion of the audience that feels sympathy for him because he's got a problem mm -hmm. that he can't control. But there's also going to be a segment of the audience that grew up with an alcoholic, and they're not going to feel sympathy for this guy. And so there's this big threat about whether or not Hangman's an alcoholic in storyline. Then this week, they did this. That's what... that I think it's me reading the thread when I watched it. That's why I thought this was just so amazing. But I don't know if Hangman's an alcoholic in storyline, but I do know he's a hero in storyline to these fans. <laughs> it's a fact. So, <laughs> everyone get your calendars out. How many times have Hey, you... Vinny. Yeah. When you plan and book in advance, yeah. and there isn't some crazy shithead yes. up the top changing everything every week, yes. you can, in fact, announce matches weeks in advance. If I came off, if I started to sound like I was going to scold the EW... Oh, I know or, you wouldn't. ...or mock them for this, no... They have the next three weeks, at least something planned for each of the next three weeks in the show. Four weeks, because in four weeks, it's the pay-per-view. That's true. And in fact, even after that, they, well, we'll get to it. Next week, Nyla Rose versus Rio, Moxley versus Santana, eye for an eye. And Nyla Rio's for the title. Yes, yes. And also for a championship match, Hangman Page and Kenny Omega versus SCU in SCU's title rematch. Then in two weeks, in Atlanta... A tag team battle royal where the winners get a title shot at Revolution against the Page Omega SCU winners. Also, Cody versus Wardlow in Wardlow's debut in a steel cage match where Cody must win to get a shot at MGF at Revolution. 
in three weeks, Omega versus Pack is finally going to happen, and it'll be a 30-minute Iron Man match. And on May 23rd, they announce Double or Nothing once again at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, Nevada. You know, I don't want to come across like I'm burying NXT, because I'm not. Because NXT, you know, this is the way that WWE does things. And I'm not saying that this is the reason that AEW was up so high this week as compared to the last few weeks. But the fact of the matter is, they've been promoting this strapping for weeks. For weeks, they have been pushing that the strapping was going to happen on this show. Mm-hmm. Here we have all of these matches. Next week on AEW, there's two championship matches that they've announced. Every Wednesday, I preview AEW and NXT and Observer Live. And when I previewed AEW, I had everything that was going to happen on the show, including the strapping. And when I previewed NXT, I knew that Charlotte was going to be there. They announced zero matches. Because I think the theory is... Well, people are just going to tune in, and they'll want to know what's coming. And maybe there is something to that. But the fact of the matter is, when you... Anybody have a kid? Do you know what happens in November? You start pushing Christmas. And you build up Christmas every day, and you talk about Santa. And by the time Christmas comes, they're out of their minds. It's simple promotion. When you announce a match... Three weeks down the road, guess what? Everybody on the television show, the announcers, the participants, maybe other wrestlers, they're going to be talking about it for three weeks. So when the three weeks comes, it seems like something very important. Like the strapping? This fucking Wardlow cage match they've been talking about, by the time it rolls around, they'll have been talking about that for six fucking weeks. Yes. So, yeah, people are going to be interested in it because it's something people are talking about. It's hard to talk about what's coming up on NXT when they've announced no matches for the show. And all they've told you is Charlotte's going to be there to maybe accept a challenge. Build up your shows, promote in advance, let people know what's coming, and they will want to see it. Why do I have to say this slowly and quietly? Because it's 2020. That's the answer. Dustin Rhodes talks about the 10 lashes. His brother Cody is a lot tougher than MGM, MJF thinks. The whole world's behind him. He got this, brother. And so it is time for the Ten Lashes. MJF comes out. He's just out there with Wardlow. Cody comes out. His energy begins and then is playing and he picture in picture during the uh, commercial break. So, <laughs> so the setup for this is really weird. We'll get the, 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 the setup out of the way. Cody wants to beat this guy so badly that he is willing to take a beating to beat him. What, if you want to beat him up that badly, you can just beat him up right now. I guess that's what Wardlow is there for. So, Cody removes... He can see on his street clothes. And he, Cody always dresses very well. And he removes his jacket, and he removes his shirt. And MGF doesn't waste much time. He merely says, I don't want to get Sully my belt to whip you. I want to use your belt. So Cody passes the belt over, and MJF snaps the belt once to freak Tony, uh, Cody out, and he gives him one last in the shoulder. And it doesn't seem that bad. It's the first one. Cody doesn't like it, flinches, sells. Max is all right. And then he removes his jacket. He's going to re- start to really lay these in now. All the heels slowly come out on the stage to watch. So the second strapping... You know what they should have said? They should have said they came out to listen. Mm. Because you can watch this on the monitor. But if you want to really hear those straps, yes, got to be out there. So Max gives him a second lashing. It is significantly harder than the first one. And Cody gets right in Max's face. But of course he can't touch him because he loses the match. MGF demands he hit him. Just hit me. Yes. He doesn't. So Max is in lashing number three, and now Cody falls to his knees. This is harder than he thought. Arn Anderson comes out to give Cody encouragement. MJF thinks Arn's there to interfere, maybe, but he's screaming, you can't help him, Arn, but Arn is just there to, to encourage Cody to keep him in this. 
So Max, him, Max, well, what Arn I think was actually telling him was, don't sell so much. Mm. Like if this were real, because he yeah. said, don't give them the satisfaction. Mm, yes, fall yes. into your knees and yes. just stand there and take them. So Maxwell's goal, if you figured it out, he wants Cody to quit. He doesn't want to do the match. So he's already removed his jacket. Now he removes his dress shirt. He's got his undershirt on. He gives him a strap number, lashing number four. It like wraps around Cody's arm and like the front of his shoulder. And now Cody is looking to the sky and he is on the verge of tears. And Max is telling him to quit. Just quit, Cody. Just quit. But Cody fires up and the place is going crazy. So all the lashings, whether it was intentional or not, they've all been to Cody's right-hand side. And so Max decides to even it out. On the fifth lashing, he gets him on the left shoulder blade. And Cody collapses again. Now Dustin Rhodes comes rushing down to the ring. No more, he says. He gets to the ring. Forget this. He's taking some. I'll take the rest. Because Dustin loves his brother so dearly. Maxwell says, Dustin, it doesn't work that way. If Cody can't, if Cody can't, qu- uh, can't go, he has to quit. Otherwise, get out of my ring and watch. And so the Rhodes brothers have a moment. They embrace. Dustin gives his brother encouragement and he leaves. And Max gives him, I, th- I think it's six and seven. They're back to back. Whap, whap, right in the back. And Cody is down and just screaming in pain. Each one now is worse than the last one. You know, they actually could have, could have, Explain in commentary. I'm just thinking about this. I've never been strapped, but like every time he was about to strap this guy, you know, Cody's like bracing for it. He gets strapped and it sucks. But then, you know, he's, he's going to get ready to brace again. Hitting him two times in a row is a shitty thing to do because you whack him that first time. Yes. And he's like, ah, and he thinks like he's going to have a little reprieve, but then he gets it again. Yes. A dick move by this prick, MJF. Yes. I, we did but you don't want to do that every time because you're wasting strappings. It's also true. So this is a strategy. Like yes, this, there is this a strategy matches. to whipping a man. We did the street fight with Nate and Sonny in Portland. There was a belt involved in that one. I got strapped once or twice. So, so that was six and seven. Those two back to back. Now the Bucks come running down. Cody rolls outside. And I feel like we had mentioned, by the way, that there is a ref out there whose job is merely to count to ten. Count to ten. Yes. yes there's ten lashes, and he, he determines, I guess, what counts as a lash in case there's any dispute. In case MJF missed. Yeah. That's actually a good question. So the Bucks are there. They're cheerleading Cody on now. Number eight, lash number eight. All, all, all the other lashes have been overhand to the upper back. Now Maxwell comes in sidearm like a submariner. Sideways across the lower back. And Cody responds by flipping MJ off. And now MJF's running out of time, man. We're up to eight lashes. Only got two more. Time to call in the big guns. Passes that belt off to Wardlow. All of Cody's friends protest. This is not the deal. This is not what we talked about. Nah, the deal was he must take ten lashes. Cody calls them all off. Because after all, MJF is in charge. This is his show. So Wardlow... There's been videos. I don't think he's even done anything physical at this point. He's just been there and been big. And this 280-pound monster, he takes that strap, and he raises it way high in the air. He brings it from way downtown, and oh, he lays Cody out, and Cody's oh, just down. Oh, my God, was this ever the strapping of a lifetime. Cody he's is dead. gone. He is no more. The whole building is on their feet, chanting Cody's name. Cody drags himself to the ropes. For a brief moment, he goes all Ultimate Warrior. And he is enraged and in agony. And he's challenging the rage and the agony, trying to feed it into the ropes. He's shaking it up and down. And he just has no more. And he gives up and he's done. MJF thinks he's won. No match, he screams. No match. The best of all possible worlds for MJF. He's given nine lashes to this motherfucker. And he doesn't have to do the match. But then out comes Brandy. Now, I did not know that the Nightmare Collective was no more. And frankly, it's better if you don't know that. And this was the moment that snaps her back into reality. That snaps her back into... Hey, that could be the storyline. Yes. Brandy comes down. And everyone, I'm sure, was expecting her to say, I can't see you like this anymore. I need to throw in the towel for you or something along those lines. But Brandy is the wife of a pro wrestler. Brandy is the wife of the son of the American dream. And she takes his hand 
and just says, it's one more. You can do this. I love you so much. And Cody looks in her eyes. And now he, he, he came into this motivated by hate. And now he is motivated by love. And he kisses his wife on the hand. And he stands tall, still, still tearfully. He's still weeping in pain. But he's, just by getting to his feet, he has made it. So MJF has one more lash, but even if he delivers it, he's a loser. So he hits him across the chest as hard as he can, and Cody goes down. But Maxwell knows he's he lost. Cody took 10 lashes. The match is still on. So everyone's cheering and going crazy. All of Cody's friends rush the ring to tend to him, make sure he's still alive. Max is fuming beside himself. Can't believe his plan was foiled. And they eventually get Cody up to his feet, and that takes a while because he's in so much pain. And so MJF turns around, and he kicks Cody right in the dick and runs away. (laughs) And Wardlow, the big scary monster, also runs away. They ran for their fucking lives. And there's a brief chase segment, and they end up just outside the crowd. Somebody attacks them. It may have legit been been a fan. I don't know. And the thing goes off the air with Cody's music playing. Broken, bloody, but not beaten. That's exactly what happened. This was an all-time great pro wrestling segment. This needs to be watched by all prospective professional wrestlers everywhere. This is what selling can do for you. They did. Yes. This was a basically a match that had a move. Strap it. That's it. But by putting it all together so dramatically, by doing each one just a little bit different, by adjusting the timing, having everyone react, have each one be progressively worse than the next, rather than start with a big one and then nine little baby baby t- t- uh, slaps. This is a, a work of art. It belongs in a museum. An amazing segment, an all-time great, a classic, and something that needs to be seen by everyone who calls himself a pro wrestling fan. Everybody was great. Cody's the greatest baby face. And oh. Jeff is the greatest heel. I don't you know, know if it was like six and seven, but there was one... There's one moment where all of a sudden this cocky asshole MJF, you see it in his face and he realizes, fuck, yes, this fucking guy is going to make 10. He's like, he's worried. Oh, yeah. He has a look of worry on his face. Like, God, I've just, I've hit this guy so hard. I think it was right before he gave it to Wardlow. I think maybe the, the idea was, oh, man, I, I know Wardlow will for sure cause him to quit. Anyway, he was great. Cody's unbelievable. Everybody involved in this was the best. The booking was perfect. It was great. I remember an interview with Batista many years ago. He was talking about WWE's policy of no more blading. Dave did not like this policy. Thought it was very hard to get the fans behind you if they didn't believe that you were taking physical pain and physical punishment. Well, Cody Rose was in physical pain and took physical punishment here. So he's going to be more loved than ever before. Well, there's a few things here. Number one, you know, I think, I mean, everyone loves Cody anyway, but there is a very famous match with Mick Foley and Randy Orton where Randy Orton takes the bump into the thumbtacks. Yes. And that was actually a big deal for Randy Orton because prior to that, Randy Orton was just a tall, good-looking guy who got a job because of his family and... You know, fans didn't see him no. as a tough guy. He was the lackey for the top guy. Once once he took that bump into that thumbtacks and had that match with Foley, everyone looked at him differently. So there is that aspect of it. And you know, I think I think everyone loved and respected Cody, but now it's been made abundantly clear that this man is one tough motherfucker in real life. He took all these lashes. The other thing is wrestling is Fake, hate to break the news to everybody, it's not real. But one way that you can get people into a match is if there is something real about it. That's why in Mexico, hair matches, the mask matches, I mean, it's predetermined, and the guys are working together, but if you buy your ticket, you will see something real. You will see history. You will see someone lose their hair, You will see someone lose their mask. You will find out who they really are, their real name, their former identity is gone forever. That's real. And this right here, this was the old hit somebody hard in a safe place. Yeah. 
Cody's not gonna. He's not gonna die. No, he's not putting his. He's not. He not one. He will not have one less match in his career because of this. No. But man, you knew that fucking hurt. Yes. You knew that sucked. And when you were watching it, it was hard to watch. It elicited a real emotion from you. You're like, fuck, that's got to hurt. When Wardlow hit that guy, I almost cried. It elicited a real emotion from you because there was something absolutely positively real and legitimate in the middle of this fake wrestling show. And which, by the way, is for one of the biggest matches on their upcoming pay per view. I don't know what this pay per view is going to do, but I think it's going to do pretty well. Mm-hmm. This was this was unbelievable in so many ways. And uh, AEW was started as an alternative to, to WWE. Duh. And they were talking a lot about how oh we're going to have win loss records and it's going to be very different attitude. If you actually watch the show, it's I th- I think a greatly superior product to WWE, but it's very similar. They are both pro wrestling shows. They have a lot in common, just from a the, the, the sheer from from a, a surface level perspective. But this is the kind of thing you are never going to see in a WWE show in 2020. And the last thing they did that was something you would never see in a WWE show in 2020. In fact, was Cody versus Dustin. So they know for these big moments, Cody and his brother are willing to do things you won't see anywhere else in a company on this and level. And Omega and Moxley. And Omega and Moxley. That's another one, yep. too. Yeah. So th- this is good. It sets them apart. So, yes, a good show, everyone, for EW. What are their best shows, actually? Well, I think it's pretty clear. So I'm voting for AEW, Brian. AEW uh, is my vote. AEW was awesome. NXT, I mean, AEW would have won over most NXT weeks. This NXT, like this AEW had a reason. Like, the lashing was a reason, but Every segment up and down the show was either set up by something. We then go to AEW Dynamite, also February 12th, 2020. SCU versus Kenny Page. Or Kenny Page. Kenny Omega and Hangman Page. I also do not have a blow show, Brian. SCU versus Hangman Page and Kenny Omega for the tag titles. So. Kenny Page. Hmm. Someone needs to start. Don't even. <laughs> Scottish broadcaster. Okay. Someone needs to catalog all of uh, Heyman Page's little uh, introductions and the graphics. When the, of his sobriety count. When the day is, day is sober. Omega, 13,268. Page, zero. So, it's already a weird thing. Both teams in the ring. No music or entrance for either one of them. And then right before the match begins, the Dark Order appears in a video. It says, we are watching. There's more than the four of us. Some of us may be closer than you think. We are waiting for the arrival of the Exalted One. When the time is right, we will strike. And so Daniels says, do you guys wrestle the match? I will go backstage to check on this. And he runs backstage and disappears and is never seen again. And it's so obvious. This led to one of the highlights of this show. When the announcers say, there's been a lot of suspicion about Chris Daniels. Yes. I've said this a thousand times. Your announcers, they need to be as smart or smarter than the audience. Not dumber. This were WWE, the announcers would be totally oblivious to this. These announcers are seeing the exact same thing that we're seeing, yes. and they're talking about it. That's great. So there's a spot during, there's a spot during this match when SCU is the heat on uh, Kenny, I think. Yes, uh, and so they got him draped over the ropes, and Sky is just doing this bit where you hold the top rope and stand on the guy's back and push down, which would be a nothing spot. Except the camera is like very super low down on the floor. It's shooting up at Scorpio Sky. And in the background, you see the big giant stage and all the spotlights and floodlights going everywhere. It looks really, really awesome. And I had just watched that super flat ending to NXT in that tiny little building. And I'm just watching this thinking, what are we even doing with this war? Now, I understand the war, the war was actually closer this week than it has been. But one show looks so much better than the other. I know that's not news. I know it's worth four or five months in now, and it's been the same story since day one, but... no, oh, we didn't even talk about the ratings. Well, very quickly, yes, things were closer than this week, but I haven't looked at all the quarters yet. I'm sure the quarters in the Observer, but this is what I was told about it, so you can read the Observer for more details. AEW did 817, which was down quite a bit. NXT did 757, which was up a little bit. Okay? Now, the big key to that AEW rating was... Whatever the AEW lead-in is, and I have no idea what the AEW lead-in normally is, but the AEW lead-in absolutely tanked. It was like down 40% from what it was on a usual week. Mm -hmm. So because of the horrible lead-in, AEW actually started very low. 
and it grew throughout the show. So the second hour, the second hour did better than the second hour last week with the strapping. It was the first hour that dragged everything down. And the NXT number was just, it started where it was, and it fell, 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 fell throughout the show. So that's the story of the ratings. There's nothing really that big to talk about. I know some people are freaking out because AEW is down so much, but, dude, we see these fluctuations every week. Some weeks it's up a little, some weeks it's down a little, Bill. This is where it's at. And next week with the cage match, I expect AEW is going to be up. So they had a very, very good tag team match here. It felt like a great wrestling match. It felt like the world tag team titles were on the line, which, in fact, they were. It was not just your average all elite dynamite or all, all elite wrestling dynamite opener. I'm not having a very good show, am I? No, you suck. Yeah. Eventually, the the buckshot lariat. Every time Hangman Page went for it, got countered, and finally, when he finally hits it, it's actually a sandwich buckshot lariat V trigger from the back. Kazarian was killed, so they covered him for the pin, and then he did grab the ropes a split second late, which I'm assuming will lead to something. Yeah, so we didn't talk about it last week, but the fan that attacked MJF was Kazarian. Oh, and I didn't know that until right this second. Well, now you know, yeah. and I don't know all of the details. Apparently, there's like a very detailed story that I don't know, but what I do know is that he was not supposed to. I shouldn't say he wasn't supposed to. It wasn't in the script. And when MJF went running, Kazarian just thought, it makes no sense for no one to try to go get this fucking guy. So I'm going to go. And he went. So basically, he called an audible. Sure. Okay. So I don't know if that's what happened here, but he was so close to the ropes that it may have just been him thinking, well, they're fucking right there. So I'm going to grab them, but it's the finish. So I'll grab them right after I get pinned. So, you know, he did something that was logical, but you can't argue about the finish because he grabbed them after the pinfall. This was a this was a total legal clean finish. The, the only thing I can say to that is he took a move right in the middle of the ring and then it seemed to me very deliberately fell next to the ropes. Well, maybe they'll do so, something, but I mean, I don't know what they can do because it was after the pin. Yes. So I see you are very bummed about this loss. This, they, they were not going to shake this off. They, they had lost the titles once. Now they lost the rematch. Who knows? And they'll be able to get another rematch of these belts. And then before they can regroup, out come the Dark Order to apparently kill them. And then the best friends run out to make it four on four. And then all the other teams, or most of them, in the tag team battle royal come out for the, to the ring. A giant brawl breaks out. The young bucks eventually clean house and hit, uh, hit dives onto the pile of bodies outside. That was fine. So Dave thinks it's going to be the young bucks versus Omega and Hangman at the pay-per-view. And the pay-per-view is in three weeks. And maybe it will be, but as I watch this Kenny Omega Hangman deal, this fucking act is over. And Hangman gets more over by the week. So, honest to God, if it's me, the Young Bucks don't win, and you do the Young Bucks versus Omega and Hangman over Memorial Day weekend, the big show in Vegas, mm. where the tickets go on sale tomorrow. Why would you rush this? And what bigger match is there than Omega and Page versus the Young Bucks? That's a big match. There's a lot of big things on this pay-per-view at the end of the month. I don't see any reason to rush to this match. You don't need to. Jim Ross is a sit-down interview with Santana. This was awesome. Yes, it was. So Tana, Santana explains, 10 years ago, he had no job, no direction, living in a basement apartment in the Bronx. He calls his dad at 3.30 in the morning and says, Dad... Every day I wake up and it's dark. And Dad says, that's my life every day. Because you see, Santana's father began to lose his sight at age 14. And he was told at the time, by age 25, you won't be able to see a thing. And then Santana says, my father was stolen with no chance to say goodbye or say what it meant to him. They did not see what happened to Santana's father, but apparently he's gone now. So that's my reality. And so that's why he's uh, so upset about Moxley taking his eyesight. And Ross. Ross asked the question of the fucking year. Yes. Actually. After all of these goddamn stupid scripted bullshit questions on WWE, this guy asked a real legitimate excellent follow-up question. He certainly did. Which is, why aren't you mad at Jericho? Moxley was retaliating for what Jericho did to him. Why aren't you mad at Jericho? 
And of course, antennas, Jericho's toady says, bottom line is we gave John, all John had to do was say yes. He built his own coffin. Tonight he'll know what it's like to be in the dark. Yep. It was great. Two excellent questions by the interview person. Yes. And excellent real answers by the person being interviewed. What a goddamn novel concept. <laughs> Jesus. We have another Darby Allen video. He still can't speak, so he's using Sammy's gimmick with the signs that he does during the commercial breaks. Smashing my throat with skateboard. You made a mistake. Sooner or later, later I'll find you. But in the meantime, Sammy, you busy at Revolution? Hit me up. And then he made a herpes joke. I was a little bit confused because he says, sooner, I'll, sooner or later I'll find you. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, let's have a match. Well, the match is still three weeks away. Hmm, okay. It could have been worded better. Yeah, take out the butt in the meantime. Sammy Guevara versus Dustin Rhodes. They're in Austin, Texas, which is, of course, the home of the Texas Longhorns, the arch rivals of the Oklahoma Sooners. So the crowd's loudly chanting, oh, you sucks at Jake Hager. I'm sure it also bothered Jim Ross a lot. Can you imagine that we saw a great match with Dustin 19 years apart? Same week. He is so freaking good. <laughs> it's unbelievable. At getting the absolute most out of everything he does. Because I watched this match closely. And for a while, it was just kind of there. It was just okay. But everything was done to set up the finish. So when he did the finish, everyone went crazy. Dustin Rhodes is awesome, everyone. The finish was... He eventually he tried several times to go for the Canadian Destroyer. Never got it. They had an epic battle on the top rope. There was actually like three epic battles in one. Because Sammy kept getting shoved off the top in different ways. He got shoved off like in a big flip under his belly. Then he got shoved off overhead somehow. And he kept getting back up. And finally, Dustin's able to, to, to throw him down and get him to stay down. Hit the Destroyer and hit his, hit his spinning suplex and win. This a, a very smart match this was by a great wrestler in Dustin Rhodes. I have to say, I was, I was more impressed with the match with uh, Rick Steiner because Rick Steiner had been on a streak of horrendous matches. That is fair. And Dustin somehow got a great match out of him on Nitro. <laughs> that is a fair point. This was Sammy, so a little less impressive, but it was a very good match. Yes. So then Dustin calls out Hager, because Hager is the one, after all, who slammed his arm in the car door. Calls him Jericho's bitch. Unfortunately, he didn't say, go on, get. That's true. That would have made it better here. Are you going to do anything or keep collecting a paycheck? You're failing in your MMA career. You're failing here. You haven't even started. You broke my arm, and I want a piece of your ass at Revolution. And Hager's getting angrier and angrier. He teases hitting the ring. And finally, Sammy talks him out of it, and Hager sulks to the back. But he liked it. But he was gotten to. <laughs> they replay Britt Baker removing Yuka Sakazaki's teeth. And then, God bless Tony Schiavone. <laughs> you know how Kevin Kelly is the Rock's designated bitch on Retro Nitro or Retro Raw? Tony Schiavone has the one who has to. Tony Schiavone is the one who has to deal with Britt Baker every week. God bless him, dude. It's gonna be it's gonna be neck and neck. Tony and Britt Baker and Pete Dunne and Matt Riddle, <laughs> which is the better duo? Because these two are in fact a fantastic duo together. And it gets better every single week. She was outstanding here. Oh, she's great. I, I, I've i never liked anything she did nearly this much. Yes, she says she knocked out Yuka Sakazaki's teeth, but she explains she was still trained, staying true to her ethical and legal obligation as a dentist, improving the overall health of the public. And she goes into great detail about how that tooth, number 19, the mandibular second molar, as you know, it had extensive decay. It led to, and then she uses a lot of big dental terms that lost me. But that's the point. That's the point. She's showing off how smart she is. She is. But the bottom line is, there was something about an abscess. That tooth was coming out anyway. It needed to come out. I did her a favor. I extracted that tooth for free. That woman just wanted out here on our dynamite stage. We can only assume she doesn't have health insurance. But you do, Mr. Starbucks. Loved it. Howled. Best. So Tony, still a professional. Tonight we have a women's championship <laughs> you know match. what I loved about Tony? Everything. Every week she just absolutely buries him, okay? 
But he's a professional. He, yes. So in the middle of burying him and talking about Mr. Starbucks, she says, or the fans chant Tony, you know, they're chanting his name, and she goes, she says something like, they're cheering for you, Mr. Starbucks. Stand up tall. <laughs> and she says it, and he suddenly stands up very tall. He does. Like, he does as she asks. Yes. And then he goes on to ask his question. So he asked about the women's title match tonight. He didn't name Riho or Nyla Rose, but that's who it was. She puts the match over, puts the women over, but does say the winner of that, winner of that match will still be number two compared to me. She looks around at the Austin crowd. I'm seeing confusion in these chubby Whataburger faces. So here's some clarification. These fans exploded. Oh, you denigrated the good name of Whataburger. I heard from one person after another that was in that building, and they said, after she said that, you could not hear a word she said afterwards. <laughs> like, everything that she said was for television. The fans, I had people going, in my section, like, the people were really mad. Like, they were legitimately angry at her. And, and I was sitting there, I was thinking yesterday, like, has MJF ever said anything that made people as angry as Britt Baker did when she talked about chubby Whataburger faces? I don't know. And the best that I could come up with was the one interview where he's doing his deal, and the fans... And I've never mentioned this before, but MGF's fucking music is just the greatest. It's the shittiest, <laughs> douchiest music. And that music hits, and people boo him and everything like that, and he does his lines, and they're like, ah, oh, boo, we don't like you. But when he did that interview, and he talked about Cody's lisp, <laughs> those fans, all of a sudden, it wasn't funny anymore. They were like, fuck you. You don't talk about our top baby faces fucking lisp, you asshole. They got really mad about that one. But that's like neck and neck with chubby Whataburger faces. I don't know who came up with that line, but that was fucking unbelievable. And then she just does the rest of the promo, and you just see people. They're furious. They're like shaking their fists, and they're screaming. They're looking like mad over this stupid line. Over Whataburger. That was awesome. Whataburger I loved is this. Fantastic, by the way. So what the live crowd missed, because they were so angry, was that she explains to them how she is a role model. She has three degrees. She is the first woman signed to AEW. There is a what a burger chant. And then she says she's made a statement, and she does the the second worst thing you can do in Austin, Texas, which is do the hook em horn sign, but do horns down. Mm. This was so awesome. She's the best. So awesome. There's a recap of Riho beating Nyla Rose on October 2nd to win the first AEW Women's title. And this loss caused Nyla to go crazy, attacking wrestlers, attacking referees, getting suspended, but finally working her way, working her way back to get this title match here. And it was Riho versus Nyla Rose. And Dude, we had this long thread on the board where this guy was just like, he was all in in trying to convince everyone else that AEW sucked. And he was going on and on about Riho. And it's like, what a week to have this fucking match. Like, God bless Nyla Rose. She's not great, okay? This was her best match I ever saw, like, by 10. Yeah. This fucking match was so good. Riho was so beloved by these fans. Oh, yes. The greatest baby face. This match was so good. So... Nyla is, as we talked about earlier, she was Goliath here, and she was winning 10 eight rounds, but couldn't put Rio away. Rio just kept finding a way to survive and stay in it. But there's a big difference. In the end, she did put her away. That is a big difference. That's a huge difference. That is a huge difference. There was one spot where they set up a table, and actually, the only thing they used it for, Nyla's setting it up on the floor, when suddenly Rio, who is, I believe, legit 98 pounds, runs across the apron. Is Wang snoring? He's not snoring, but he's out. We woke a sleeping wang. We, we put him to sleep. <laughs> Keep going. Riho he's runs... Flaccid. <laughs> he's flaccid. wang. <laughs> Riho runs... He's so proud. <laughs> Go ahead. Riho runs along the apron, runs across the table to dropkick Nyla, because she's so small she won't break it. So... For a lot of this match, Rio is too small and too fast to get a hold of. It's like having a wrestling match with a mosquito. You just can't grab the damn thing. And finally, Naya grabs a hold of her, and then it's just the end. And then she works her over and smashes her for a long time. She hits a big diving knee. That only gets two. She has an avalanche Death Valley driver. 
That only gets two. And then things get insider. Because Nyla picks her up, and Nyla goes for the one-winged angel. The finisher of Riho's boyfriend, Kenny Omega, which has never been talked about on screen. And then Rio escapes and counters with a Snapdragon suplex, Kenny's other big move. Rio gets a bunch of near falls. Northern Lights gets two. A top rope foot stomp only gets one. And then she gets another two more foot, stomp, foot stomps, actually. But Nyla gets a foot on the ropes. And then Nyla catches her with a big spear and a beast bomb for the win. She is your new women's champion. And this was a tremendous TV match. So this this company's been around on TV for four, almost five months now, and they've been running shows prior to that. And they do title changes so rarely yeah. that the belts actually mean something to these fans. And so even though these fans loved Riho, when Nyla won, they fucking lost their minds because they saw a championship change in a great match. This is the second title change in AEW history. Yes. yes. So... I don't ordinarily watch the picture in picture during the, uh, the the commercial break, but I couldn't help but notice Nyla is going backstage celebrating, and she's going backstage holding up her belt in all the women's faces, and then suddenly there's Kenny, and they had a conversation, and we couldn't hear it because it was during the commercial break. But again, they're, they're, this this is leading somewhere. This is, everything in AEW goes somewhere, or has or has or, or is a payoff to something that has set that up. Everything happens for a reason. Lexi interviews the inner circle. Asks Jericho, who quickly corrects her, it's Mr. Jericho. He says he has big news for next week. He is sick that he has to defend this title against John Moxley at Revolution on February 29th, but he will because he's an honorable man. But in the meantime, he has scoured the world for an assassin. A man who's been ruining careers around the globe. I'm an honorable man, but I have found an assassin. Because Chris Jericho was great. He's a hypocrite yeah. all the time. Yes. And that assassin's Which name... Which is not even my funniest... My favorite Chris Jericho line is the very next line, okay? Mm-hmm. Just think about this. This is what he said. He says, If Moxley is lucky enough and stupid enough to survive Santana tonight, next week he'll face Jeff Cobb. Didn't pick up on it? If Moxley is lucky enough... And stupid enough. Yes. What? Well, the smart thing to do would be to lose to Santana and then go home and never wrestle again. I see. Yeah. That's where that comes from. I got it. Yeah. So, I yes. the line. If he's lucky enough and stupid enough to survive, if he were smart, he'd lose. <laughs> he'd lose. He'd... But he's so stupid, he could win. <laughs> that, that is, is what... a great out. That like, is... if, you, if you win, you're lucky, but you're also stupid. Right. Okay. <laughs> so yes, as you glossed over, Jeff Cobb is an all elite wrestling man. He sure well, he's 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 in as the assassin. For for at least one Quite frankly, yes. Right now, yeah. He may sign for longer, but right now he's just the assassin. Yes. So yes, if you beat Santana tonight, your reward is a match against Jeff Cobb next week. I'll see you in hell, he screams. And we have a very short video of Jeff Cobb destroying people in uh I believe it was APW. Yes. Yeah. So we're seventy minutes into the show. And only now, for the first time, do they mention or do a recap of the strapping yeah. from last week. So they recap it. Whoever decided to shoot this in super slow-mo was brilliant. As you see the strap strike Cody in the back, and you see the shockwave ripple across his shoulders and up into his neck. God, they should have got one of those UFC cameras. The phantom cam? Yeah. Oh, my God. The strapping on the, the phantom cam, you would have sold another 100,000 buys. Yes. So Brandy comes out to to join the announce desk. She thanks them all for having her. She especially thanks Excalibur after all the horrible things she said about him. He says, it's water under the bridge. They move on. God bless her. She's still not very good at this. MJF versus Jungle Boy. What a great match. First of all, both guys send their friends to the back. Wardlow gets sent to the back. And Luchasaurus and uh, Marco get sent to the back. And then they had the most old school match you will see on Dynamite in two, in 2020. This was it was totally old school with modern day spots. This was a 1970s Carolinas opener with Lucha. Yes, <laughs> and it was awesome. Arn is watching backstage. So Jungle Boy is running wild at the end. He goes for a power bomb, but his back gives out. MJF is working his back. So MJF puts him in. What the hell is this move called? I know it has a name. I've seen this a hundred times before. 
The old, Gory Special? Was it the Gory Special? I thought it was, it was like the Gory Backbreaker. It was something like that. Yes. Puts him in the Backbreaker. Just stands there. Yeah. I loved it. Yes. <laughs> it's like a torture rack, but vertical instead of yes. holding across the shoulder. So. <laughs> then he looks up at Brandy, says, you could have had a real man, and flagrantly grabs his junk. <laughs> Jim Ross lost his fucking mind. Brandy didn't He's care. cutting a promo on this guy. He's ready to jump out of the booth and go down and beat MJF's ass. It was awesome. So MGF then gets in trouble again, and now Wardlow returns. He was sent to the back at first, but then when MGF gets in trouble, there's Wardlow's always there. He passes the ring to MGF, and MGF hits the big loaded ring punch and the double cross for the finish. This is a very, very, very good wrestling match by two men with a combined age less than Dustin Rhodes or Chris Jericho. And it's such a simple story, and I don't know if it's going to happen in the Cody match, but like... You know the day's coming where MJF goes for the punch, or Wardlow throws the ring, but the other guy gets the ring. That'll happen. They put the ring on. They punch MJF. You know what they could even do, which I don't expect, but they've never done a DQ. Not yet. I don't think the pay-per-view is the time to do it. I also... <laughs> but if Wardlow threw that fucking ring at MJF and Cody caught it, mm. and Cody put it on his hand... Yeah. And he punched MJF and got caught, and the referee disqualified Cody. Like, if you're going to do a DQ, that's the time to do it. The heat for that would be so unbelievable. Awesome. You would need something huge to cap off the pay-per-view to make people happy. Well, but, it's a Jericho-Moxley match. Well, that, that certainly Moxley could win the title or do something. It. Yeah, but that would be awesome. Yes. That would be very awesome. It does, it does feel too early in the whole thing for that to happen. MGF can have this ring for well, not years. Not if the feud's going to continue. If you want to continue this feud, yeah. that's one way to do it. So speaking of Wardlow, he comes in afterwards. He hits Jungle Boy with a throwing F5. It's an F5 where he doesn't leave his feet. just launches him into the air and watches him. I remember many years ago, like the, in his first run in the mid-2000s, Brock Lesnar basically did the same thing to Shannon Moore. Just did an F5 where he threw him to the heavens. He's looking up at Shannon Moore way high above him. And then just for fun, falls to his back as Shannon Moore lands. Warlow didn't even do that. He just stayed in his feet the whole time. And then Luchasaurus and Marco ran him off. We have a pack video. He's training, doing his road work and his gym work, also burying Kenny the entire time. You it's Black and white. It was, it was awesome. The, 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 it's a very weird sort of, I don't even know how to describe it, like I'm watching a horror movie. It's black and kinda. white and... Guy starts walking very in the door, but then they, they cut to him in the door. They do those weird cuts. Very harsh lighting. All It's all very very noir. So are Darby's, actually. He says, you ain't the same since I choked you out in Chicago. All your problems are because of me. In two weeks, I get my rubber match. 30 minutes with the best in the world. Aren't you a lucky bastard? It was great. Next week, Wardlow versus Cody in a cage match in Atlanta. A tag team battle royal and just announced the Lucha Brothers versus Paige and Omega for the tag titles. As soon as that is on screen, in my brain, I am thinking, well, why don't they have to be in the battle royal then? And before my brain can even finish asking that question, they explain the Lucha Brothers are getting a title shot because they are the last team to beat Paige and Omega and they pinned them in that eight man tag match a week or two back. What a shocker. That makes sense. Yes. Everything on this show makes sense. How novel. And happens for a reason and sets us something else down the road. You, as a, as a viewer, are rewarded for paying attention. And then in two weeks, the Omega Pack Iron Man match and a revolution, officially, Dustin Rhodes versus Jake Hager in Jake Hager's AEW in-ring debut. Mm. The inner circle goes to their suite. I love that Jericho's entrance and music is now a can't-miss segment on the show. Oh, yeah. And it is. Main event, John Moxley versus Santana, eye for an eye. All I could think watching this was John Moxley has won at life and continues to win at life. He gets to go wherever he wants to go, do whatever he wants to do. He's a big star everywhere he goes. We just watched him versus Suzuki on Sunday night. Now watching him versus Santana. He's main eventing against Jericho coming up. He's winning at life. So I have a very good match. Dude, this match... So, this could have been any wacky main event on Dynamite. You do the match, Moxley wins because he's going to the pay-per-view. But it's an eye-for-an-eye eye match. It's an eye-for-an-eye. An eye. One man's got an eye patch, the other man's got an eye patch. 
So that becomes the whole story of the match. First, Ortiz blows the bubbly into the eyes of John Moxley. Now he's totally blind. Now he can't see at all. So now, in fact, it is an eye for an eye. He's blind. The other guy has one eye. Advantage. So then Santana goes for a choke, and so Moxley grabs him, and he digs his thumb into the eye of Santana. Now they're both blind. And for five seconds, they're stumbling and bumbling around this ring. They can't see a damn thing. And then they back into each other, and Moxley's quicker. And he spins around blinded. He hits that DDT. He gets the pin. He wins the eye for the eye match. But he's still blind. Mm -hmm. And so the heels beat his ass. And they continue to blind him more. Yep. Ortiz jumps on him, sticks both thumbs in both eyes. Out comes the inner circle. It's awesome because Hager and Guevara are running down there as fast as they can, jumping the guardrail. They're all, they're all about speed. Jericho is moseying. <laughs> He's got his henchmen to do the dirty work. He can take his hey, time. Hey, Darth look Vader at. in the original. Yes. The stormtroopers go in, they kill everybody, yes. and then he walks in and just looks around. Ah, yeah, they're all dead. Now. There's a reason this happens with all the great villains, because it's great. Yes. So, He's got henchmen. Yeah, they, they can. Yes, exactly. So they work over his eyeballs. They work over his back. They work over his balls. They start having finishers on him. And finally, he's His done. wang. He's done. He's finished. And they're all posing and making fun of him. Jake Hager. I first saw Jake Hager September 9th, 2008. He made his debut on ECW. 12 years ago. He has never shown as much charisma and personality as he did here, smiling and flexing and giving a big thumbs up for what he had done to this poor, poor John Moxley. He was so awesome. And then, just to really drive a nail in this coffin, out comes Jeff Cobb and his long hair to lay out Moxley, give him a tour of the islands, and leave him planted and doomed. This was great. And in the middle of this, just out of nowhere, Sammy Guevara does the most awesome 630 you've ever seen. Yes! <laughs> because he's just been like a whipping boy, and he goes in there, he gets his ass beat all the time, and he has matches, but it's largely him getting his ass beat. And you forget that he can do all sorts of crazy shit. Yes. And so, like, right in the middle of this beating, all of a sudden you see this falling star. He fucking does the fastest 630. It was, like, twice as fast as Ricochet. I don't even know how. And just crushes this dude and just gets up and dances. Mm -hmm. This show was great. Some people said this was the best episode of Dynamite they'd ever seen. And as I review it, it sure as shit does sound like the best dynamite we've ever there's reviewed. a lot of great stuff on that show but i i still feel like there have been better episodes maybe because of individual incidents there are probably like, because of the strapping like i'll never forget that show yeah but in three weeks i'll probably forget this one but i mean there was not one i said this on observer live my whole job from having done this for 95 till today what's that uh, that would be 50, 25 years. Oh, my God. 25 yeah. fucking years. I'm an old guy. But for 25 fucking years, I've been watching wrestling all over the world. So I watch these shows, and I just see everything, and I think, what would I have changed? Right? Sure. I can't think of one fucking thing I would have changed on this whole show. Um, You got me. <laughs> I'm drawing a blank, and I, I, I like had, one thing. What is I, I, had I can't few even things say on NXT. I mean, maybe at best they probably had a commercial where the heat was during the break, but like you, you can't win them all. Yeah. That may be the only thing on this entire show. Like everything else, it was like, man, even like the Nyla thing. One on thing. paper, I would have changed the Nyla thing. I found one, but after I saw it, yeah. they were right. I found one you would have changed. What's that? The sign Darby had about in the meantime. That, okay, fine. It was not a perfect diet show. That's it, though. That's it. Yeah. Well, time to vote, Brian. I think I think it's pretty clear. I, I the winner would be AEW this week. I, I I have kind of a you're talking about ring rust and stuff. Did you happen to watch Seamus did a training video? He's been doing lots of training videos for years now, but he did a video about shaking off ring rust. He goes to the performance center to 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 work out, and the three guys he brings with him to train are Drew Gulak, who would, that would Great, be a good very one. Very accomplished wrestler. Can tell you how to do things. Cesaro. Yeah. He's worked with closely in his, in his weight class and, a, and, a, and an athletic freak. And also Braun Strowman. Well. Which didn't make me laugh. But, need guys to lift. But the, the, the reason I bring this up is because 
you know, as like as Cesaro is an athletic freak, and Gulak has has been doing this and working at it so long, it's just natural to him. And Sheamus, God bless the guy, but it's very clear the actual wrestling part of being a pro wrestler does not come naturally to him. And they had to go back to some very fundamental things, like which foot do you step with when coming out of the ropes? You know, and 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 this, this is like very early wrestling school stuff he had to get picked up on. So credit to him for having the courage to show this is not natural to him and also for working so hard that when he was doing this full time it looked natural to him that just reminded me of what you're talking about you know what's funny is i mentioned this when we interviewed darby allen on the jericho cruise because he was there but i wrestled many matches for a long long time and in 2010 i took I was going to do a loser leaves town for a 30 days match, and I was gone for four years. Right. So I, <laughs> I, I for the step. overextended the stipulation, yeah. yes. So four years later, I came back. I had one match with Buddy, and then it was four more years before I had the Chop and Roll Express match. But, like, I'm not saying these matches were, like, blow away, tear down the house matches, but in none of those matches, like, every, every one of those matches, as soon as the bell rang, it was like I had not been gone. I could just do it like I'd always done it. I, I, there was nothing, just nothing that was, oh my God, I forgot how to do this or that. But in the middle of all of that, one day, Buddy wanted me to come out to the school. He wanted me to come out and, and help all the guys do matches. And it just happened to be a day that young Darby Allen was there. Oh, hey. That's why I told him this story. Yes. I got in that fucking ring and I couldn't do anything i couldn't remember a fucking thing i like couldn't remember what side to lock up on like which arm i couldn't fucking do anything it was the worst like you think that first match i had with craig where i tripped running the ropes and hit the middle rope and bounced back it was just the fucking most horrible match Mm -hmm. it was the worst performance i ever had in a ring i'm talking going back to the ywf I have never been as horrible in the ring as I was that one fucking day. And, of course, you know, Buddy built me up all big. Oh, this guy is great, blah, 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 blah. I fucking came out. It was just fucking terrible. I was like, I'm never going to get in the ring again. And then eventually, like, Filthy talked me into doing the the chop and roll match. And I I had, like, going into that match, I thought, fuck, good thing this is a tag match. Because I may not remember how to do anything. But for whatever reason, I got in and I could do everything. Well, you I was totally fine after that. But it was like one fucking day. It was exactly what you're explaining with Seamus. Yeah. I couldn't do a fucking headlock. T- I couldn't do anything that day. I was the worst wrestler there had ever been that day. And then it was just like, got out of my system. Good, yeah. I got being terrible out of my system. <laughs> but my God, I was fucking awful. I told, I told Darby that he distinctly remember i bet he did goes, god buddy was talking about this guy he's fucking awful it's like you're right that's that was awesome. the worst day i ever had that's awesome we also watched aew dynamite february 19th 2020 we opened with a tag team battle royal i love because this is a tag team battle royal they had a cool idea for a cool visual to start the match which is we'll start with all the teams in the floor we'll ring the bell and they'll all hit the ring and fight so okay cool visual cool idea except i'm thinking to myself why would you get in the ring? And it turns out several teams did not for a while. Sure. They were smart. So the Dark Order's hanging out for a bit. Finally, they put their masks on to attack SCU. And it- Let me go through this match, Vinny. I wrote it down, virtually everything that happened. Okay, I did not. Because everything played in everything else. That's true. So the rules were you had to eliminate both members. Yes. So it's not just you throw out Nick and Matt's eliminated. Right. You have to throw out both guys. So first, Scorpio does this big dive off the top, and he wipes everybody out. Then young Jack Evans thinks, ha, ah, yes. I guess the no bumps in the Battle Royal rules have been rescinded. Yes. I'll dive on everybody. So we need to do this in the Battle Royal for 20 years. He leaps, and no one bumps, and they throw him out. <laughs> Private Party tossed out T-Hawk. The Dark Order, as you know, to put their masks on. And they cut a promo. There's a creepy guy in the front row who I don't even think is a wrestler. It's the guy from the commercials they've yes. been doing. Yeah. He says, SCU, is it not funny that your man Christopher Daniels isn't here tonight? The exalted one is coming. So SCU gets dumped because they got distracted. Dark Order gets eliminated. So then SCU dives into Dark Order. They start brawling in the crowd. 
And sitting there in a folding chair, nonchalantly watching this fucking brawl, is Raven. (laughs) Fantastic. So the reason Raven's there, I think, is because when they had the voice of the Exalted One, I don't know if this is true or not, but they claimed on Reddit that they slowed it down or sped it up or Mm. changed the pitch or whatever, and that it was Raven. Interesting. So I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if Raven did the voiceovers. That's what they claimed. But anyway... Since it was out, they just had Raven sit there. I think it's great. It's it the, awesome. It, it, it's the easiest thing in the world to say, Raven, want to fly you in for one show. And that was you... Atlanta. He probably lives there. Even better. Yeah. <laughs> Even better. We're going to have one show. All you got to do is be on camera and get people talking. Just watch this match. Yes. Luchasaurus booted Shima. They're out. They run wild till they got distracted by the bunny. Dark Order offers Shima a mask. He takes the mask. He, 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 he's he, considering it. He takes it and leaves with it. I think it was Tony who said, actually, I think it would be a good move for him. <laughs> well, he's not wrong, quite frankly. Yes. Nick gets to play WWE star in the Royal Rumble. He runs wild on everybody and then gets tossed. Yes. Happens every time in the Royal Rumble. People boo like crazy for that. Butcher and Luchasaurus have a battle. A hoss fight, as they called it. Yeah, Santana and Ortiz toss private party, which they deserve because Isaiah Cassidy can't stop screeching. Yes. Which is Melina, go away, heat with me. Jungle Boy got tossed. Everyone gangs up and tossed Luchasaurus. Thunderous boos for that one. Yes. Best friends tried to hug, but the Butcher broke it up and tossed, uh, I guess... They tossed Chuck first. Chuck, yes. They went to toss Trent, but... I honestly don't know where he came from, but Orange Cassidy was there to catch Trent on his shoulders. Yes. And give the thumbs up. He's playing the role of Otis. That is actually true. Royal Rumble. That's actually true. Then the blade gets tossed. So it comes down to Butcher, Trent, Santana, and Ortiz. So three singles in a team. And Matt Jackson. And Matt. Trent and Matt did a best friend's hug. They got a big pop. Bunny, for some reason, gave Orange Cassidy a low blow outside. Keep him right in the oranges. I don't know what happened there, but I'm sure that'll be well, something. Well, there, there's something. Butcher and Trent were fighting in the apron, and Orange had already saved Trent once. I see. So Bunny and Orange have their stare down. Bunny kicks Orange right in the fruits. He goes down. Now there's nobody there to catch Trent. He's immediately knocked off the apron. I see. So Matt spears him off the apron to eliminate him, but he goes through the middle rope. So, yes, Butcher had gone so over Matt the top. is not eliminated. Yes. So now it's down to Matt versus Proud and Powerful by himself. So Sammy trips up Matt. Pa- Proud and Powerful hit the street sweeper. He lands on the apron when they toss him. Matt super kicks Ortiz off the apron. Sammy comes off the top. Matt kills him with the greatest super kick ever. And I don't care what anyone says, in execution, this was better than Michaels and Shelton Benjamin. I don't know if it was the best super kick ever, but it was the best bump for a super kick ever. He fucking (laughs) killed this guy and unfortunately screwed up his ankle. That sucks. Which had already been screwed up. Santana got tossed and... uh, That's it. Matt wins. Matt won. So this battle royal was fucking awesome. Yes. We saw the battle royal at All In and people hated it and like... You weren't there because it was awesome. Was it all in? Whatever Battle Royal it was. We, we watched the, uh, it was the, August. the Joker's Wild Deck sure. card or whatever it was. Anyway, that yeah. Battle Royal was really fun. This Battle Royal was awesome. I don't want to hear otherwise. Mm. It was great. This is most Battle Royals suck. Almost all of them. This is a very, very good Battle Royal. This is, this is worth to going out of your way to see. And so the Bucks win. Nick runs back out to celebrate with his brother for winning. They get the title shot of the pay-per-view. We cut backstage where the champions, Hangman Page and Kenny Omega, are watching with varying degrees of enthusiasm as their friends, the Bucks, have won this title shot. And uh, there was there there was a bit when got in this battle royal, everyone was brawling on the floor. It was a little silly, but all anyone's going to remember about this is the good stuff, and it was a total win. Brandy, Cody, and the dog arrive at the building. The announcers run down the show. Cody versus Wardlow in a cage match. The Lucha Brothers challenge Hangman Page and Kenny Omega for the tag titles. Jeff Cobb versus John Moxley. And right now, Chris Statlander versus Shanna. So, <laughs> the highlight of this match to me. Chris Statlander comes out. She's got wacky makeup all over her body. She hails from, I believe, the Andromeda system. That's her, that's her uh, hometown. She claims to be the galaxy's best alien or whatever. So, <laughs> Jim Ross 
Let me go through this one. Okay. First, Jim Ross asks Britt Baker, what's up with this alien thing? Britt was so great on commentary because she's not over the top. She's understated in everything she says. Like, she's over being a commentator. She doesn't want to do it, but she's forced to. So all of her comedy is, like, low-key. Sure. So he says, tell me about this alien thing. And Britt just nonchalantly says, I have no idea. I'm more into oral health. <laughs> yes. yes. So perfect. Awesome. That's a perfect line. Then Tony says, Excalibur. What's going on? Why is she an alien? And basically, Excalibur starts reciting explain. everything I've just said. He says, well, she believes that she's from the Andromeda Galaxy, and her spaceship crashed in Area 51. And as soon as he says the words Area 51, Jim Ross says, that's it. No more. We're done. <laughs> so awesome. He cannot take any He's, more of this. He will not have anything to do with this foolishness. No, this is bullshit. <laughs> Let's move on with this match. <laughs> yes. Then Britt has this cup of coffee that she gives Tony. It's, yes. a, it's a cup with his face on it. But she spells his name wrong. Of course. Died. Died. And then the match was just there. The first half of this match is built around booping and touching each other on the nose. And I I also hated this, but I will say it worked in the building. They're not there to entertain me. They're there to entertain the thousands of fans watching the people at home. So good good play to them. And the second half of the match after the break, it was an actual wrestling match. It was fun. Statlider wins by... <laughs> she, she, I, she was in a... I think it was like she was down on one knee and uh, uh, Shannon's behind her. And... Statlander grabs her and lunges up. A very impressive lift. And does the cradle tombstone, which is horrifying, and pins her. So, hey, credit to them. This is fun. I gotta say one thing about Statlander. Like, the alien thing is just, it's too, the idea of it is too goofy for me. But, and I can't even believe I'm defending this to a degree. Nothing she does exposes the business. I'm saying, yeah, no, like there's nothing she does where I'm supposed to believe she's actually an alien. They don't do a skit where her saucer lands and she gets out. I mean, if 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 the story ends up being, which it is, that she's a normal person who's pretending to be an alien to mess with her opponents or or marketing purposes or whatever, like fine, that's like it's not like she touches. It's not like she touches Shanna on the nose and Britt suddenly grabs her face because her nose hurts or some fucking bullshit like that. Yes. It's like she says she's an alien. She touches your nose like fucking E.T. or whatever. To irritate But you. that's it. Yes. Like, it's not like she levitates or she has magic happen. She's just a weird person who Chris is Stantlander, crazy. Chris Stantlander calling herself an alien is not that much more ridiculous than Bret Hart calling himself a hitman. Sure. He didn't not, actually kill people for money. We don't know that, but I mean, it's... I, most likely. He probably didn't kill anyone for yes. money. I mean, there was never a skit where he fucking killed somebody. No. That's my point. Yes. We had a recap of Nyla Rose's title win last week. So, is this is the guy in the Scooby-Doo costume just traveling the country going to AEW shows? Because yes. he was on the show last week, and he was on the show this week in the exact same seat. This may be a problem. Maybe Bret Hart should kill this guy. Get him off TV. So... Tony interviews Nyla Rose, who I thought got a really good promo. It started sketchy, but it ended up really good. She holds up the belt, says, this is justice. I should have been on the posters, but waiting for this made me hungry. When I get hungry, I break bitches. I cut Riho's strings, she says, which is a meta line. I'll be a one-time champion because nobody can beat me. Nobody is a beast like me. And then Statlander comes out. She doesn't say anything. She just does, she just boops the belt. And this upsets Nyla. Big Swole comes out and gets Nyla's face, and then they're all separated. But hey, they set up a couple of challengers to see who's going to challenge Nyla Rose next. That's all fine. Jeff Cobb versus John Moxley. They brought in Taz for the guy who does suplexes. Brilliant! Brilliant! I love Taz doing matches like this. Jericho, Guevara, and Hager have tickets, so they all sit in the crowd. They're having a great old time. Cobb at one point makes a cover, but picks Mox up because he's the hired gun. He is, in fact, hired to kill someone here. He's not supposed to win this match. Yeah, he's there to beat the guy up. He's supposed to beat Which Moxley he did. Up and give Jericho an easier match at a, a Revolution. So they did the finish. I want to say it was Ricky Steamboat and one of the British Bulldogs who did this it was, it was. It was uh, It was Randy Savage, Savage and Dynamite Kid. Dynamite Kid. Yeah. Uh, one guy hits a superplex, but the guy who takes a super, superplex 
cradles the legs for the pin. So Cobb did a superplex, but uh, Moxley cradles him, gets the win. As soon as he's won, the inner circle attacks. I want to add that even though Taz was really good on commentary, and he was there because he was the master of the suplex, the actual best line was when Cobb suplexed Moxley on the floor and Jim Ross said he suplexed him out of his brains. <laughs> that was a great line. And I don't even know if he meant to say it, because as soon as he said it, he said something like, it's going to be my line now. <laughs> All right. So the inner circle attacks. Dustin Rose tries to make the save, but he's just one guy. The lights go out. Darby Allen makes his big return. Huge pop. And he just skates down to the ring, does a couple of skateboard spots, and uh, Moxley catches Cobb with a paradigm shift to get his uh, revenge for the beating. Briefly brawls with Jericho, but Jericho flees because, well, pay-per-views in 10 days. Holy smokes, a pop that Darby Allen got for returning. Oh, yeah. From getting his, his neck necked on a skateboard. Mm-hmm. And a couple of skits in the park with signs. It is impossible to say with a straight face that they're not making stars. No. Are people saying this? Well, of course they are. Okay. Lucha Brothers versus Hangman Page and Kenny Omega. The match was awesome. It was a very fun match. So for the, 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 <laughs> the first half of this match... It was a good match. I was surprised how little heat there was, especially when Hangman got a hot tag and made a great comeback. And then Ray Phoenix. Holy Christ, this guy. He's just a superhero out there for a few minutes. Then everything is crazy. Uh, he's doing a rope walk kick. This insane jumping run where he flew about 50 feet in the air. Everyone looks great from that point on. The crowd's super red hot. Uh, the buckshot backfires, which seems to happen every single week. and, uh, and It does happen every single week. Page waffles Omega again. Omega survives the Penta driver, catches Phoenix with, a, I think it was Excalibur. Phoenix tries some kind of dive off the top, and Omega leaps off and hits him, hits him with a V-trigger in midair. I think it was Excalibur who called it the anti-air knee strike, which is perfect. It's exactly what it was and sounds cool. He gets an underhook pile driver for a near fall, but then they hit him with the sandwich buckshot V-trigger. Phoenix is pinned. Second half of this match was awesome. And this sets up Bucks versus Page and Omega at Revolution. The Bucks come out to congratulate Omega, which irritates Page a little bit. There's a tug of war over Omega, and he sides with Page. He makes it clear. We're friends. This is my tag team partner. I'm going to fight with him against you at this pay-per-view. And awesome. Paige left to chug beers. And Paige leaves to drink beers in the crowd. Yeah, this, uh, this Ray Phoenix. Dude. Like, every week he's really good, but he was, like, the greatest ever. He was this amazing on the week. show. He had some spot that he did where it was a, a springboard into a Hurricane Rana taking Omega off the apron to the floor. It was just absolutely insane. Like, everything he did was awesome. I watch these shows by myself on my laptop, and I almost always, I'm silent for two hours. When he did the rope walk kick, I screamed, and when he did that jumping Rana, I screamed louder. Yeah. He's ridiculous. What he does shouldn't be possible. But it is. But it is. By one guy, and it's Ray Phoenix. We have a clip of the guys getting to see their action figures for the first time and marking out for him. The best part of this to me is Cody and Jericho, who have had like 500 toys made of themselves. But they still go crazy when they get a new action figure. And the detail and the gear and the hair and all that. Well, Jericho was a little more low-key, but but Cody was weeping, he as was, was Brandy. Yeah. Jericho should have asked them, now, when this rings up, it's going to ring up as a Jericho toy, not a Hogan toy, right? That's what he should have said. Yes. Should do an angle where it rings up as Hogan. That would be awesome. Next week, the Pac Omega Iron Man match as well as the Best Friends versus the Butcher and Blade after their confrontation in the Battle Royal, because everything in AEW happens for a reason and leads to something down the line. And at Revolution, of course, the Young Bucks versus Kenny Omega and Hangman Page. Get a Cody Cody video package, type up the cage match. The important thing here is where Cody's talking about how dangerous the cage match is, and as he notes, whoever gets thrown into the cage first, that's going to be a game changer. So it's Wardlow versus Cody inside a steel cage. They're in Atlanta. Cody is so ridiculously beloved. What a hero Cody Rhodes is. What a hero he was on the show. Yes. So he comes out to fight, and sure enough, Cody is the first one to hit the cage, and it's a game changer. 
He sells with a giant, massive monster war, though, for like 10 straight minutes because he hit the cage first. He hit the cage, and he's just bleeding everywhere. After the break, he's just bloody as hell. There's blood here. There's blood there. He's getting his ass kicked. The story is, there is no escape the cage. This is important. You must be beaten inside yes. this cage. Very important. So, so at one point, Wardlow... His finishing move, by the way, where he does the F5 but does not go down, they call it the F10. So at one point, Cody gets thrown into the door, which flies open. And I thought, something stupid's going to happen, and I'm going to be really angry. I was wrong. I apologize, AEW, for doubting you. So the door is open. Cody's bloody head is hanging out of it, and Arn is looking on. And MJF runs up from behind the door, and he's screaming at Arn. Talk about generations of heat, he says. Do it to him like it did his daddy. And he gestures for Arn to slam that door on Cody's head. And Arn grabs the door, and he looks at Cody, and he swings it the other way into MJF's face, and MJF goes flying, and there's a big giant pop. So Cody makes his big comeback. And Wardlow, we barely got to see him work a match here. He was a big, scary guy who stood there and let Cody bounce off him. He made a very fine wall. And I don't mean the wall, brother. I mean, like an actual wall, an actual immobile piece of, 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 of uh, building. So he did hit a senton for two, which is very impressive. And finally, uh, MJF tosses the ring into the ring. But Cody is able to nut shot Ward, though, get the ring and, and hit him with it. To which... Jim Ross says, MJF is beside himself. That means there's two turds on the outside. So MJF is outraged. He starts climbing the cage. Brandy hits him with a care, hits him with a chair to bring him down. He's appalled she hit him. But before anything else can happen, because they're not stupid, Arn grabs MJF, throws him in the crowd, the place is going crazy. Cody hits crossroads. Warlow kicks out of that because he's a big, strong, scary guy. And Cody looks to the sky. And he starts to climb. And I've been watching Jeff Hardy cage matches for a long time, and Kurt Angle and Cody. I've seen a lot of guys fly off a lot of cages. This cage was enormous. This cage was... Dude, he climbs up this thing, and he just... He climbed up, and he jumped. Yeah. And on the Observer Radio show, I said, I'll bet you anything that this guy just... His idea was the moment I get up there, I'm jumping. If I think about if it. If I stop for one second, yes. if I look down, like I'm not gonna want to do this. And and like I that's what I thought when I saw it. Like I know what he's doing. He went up there and like he's just gonna go. Yeah. And then I had people say, Oh, you know, they were really close to the end of the show. I think he was just being rushed and that sort of thing. Nope. Cody on Twitter said, Deathly afraid of heights. Wow. That fucking guy went up there, and it was like, there's no time to think. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm going to get up there, and I'm going to jump. And he did, and he fucking hit his moonsault. I think this was legitimately a 15-foot steel cage. It was fucking horrifying. <laughs> this screwed up Kurt Angle's knees, like, for life when he did that off that cage yeah. in, in uh, I think it was WWE. It might have been TNA, but well, one way or the other. To be fair, Angle did not have Wardlow to catch him or break his fall. That's true. He that just helped. crashed. That helped. But yeah, he hit it, and then he got the win. And, like, no matter how afraid of heights he was, after he got the pin, he climbed right up to the top of that fucking cage again, starts screaming at MJF as the show goes off the air. Yes. That was, I'm sure, a timing issue. Now, this match was great. The storyline is great. Okay? But if you watch the storyline, MJF is the dastardly heel. Cody is the beloved baby face. That's for sure. And we're leading towards a match here. And MJF laid out a whole bunch of stipulations, and he did terrible things. Like, he strapped Cody, he's kicked him in the balls. Threatened his wife. Threatened uh, the whole Much like yards. Velveteen Dream, by the way. But you know what? As you follow this storyline, I can't help but notice that MJF is constantly being thwarted. Mm. Last week, he did get his ten lashes in. But you could see at Lash 8 or 9 that he had that look on his face like, fuck, this guy isn't going to quit. Yes. And so even though he strapped him 10 times, he was foiled. Then in this match here, he got the cage door slammed in his face by Arn. He got thrown into the crowd. And his man lost. Mm -hmm. He got thwarted again. On the boat. 
He was he, thrown into the pool. That's true. And the week after the boat, he hired Butcher and Blade to get revenge, and they were beaten. And he was thwarted. Yes. Okay, so he's been thwarted it's all been over a the bad place. couple months. Now, obviously what they have to do Wednesday is he has to do everything in his power to get Cody to hit him. Yeah, yeah. That's the last, that's his last chance to avoid this match, okay? Now, obviously, the match is going to happen. So on Wednesday, he's going to be thwarted, all right? Mm -hmm. My point of all of this is, it feels to me like he's been thwarted, 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 thwarted. He has to win this match. Of course. Okay? Now, when I think about how does MJF win this match, I think I mentioned this before. I'm not sure that if I were Tony Khan, I would have the balls to do this. And I don't even know how this would be, how the fans would react to this. But I think because they love Cody so much and they hate MJF so much, I actually think it would work. There's never been a disqualification. Yes. So it feels to me like the ref has to either catch Cody kicking him in the balls because MJF kicked him in the balls repeatedly. Or he's got to get the ring. That's better. And hit MJF with the ring, and the referee catches him, and it's the first disqualification. And I mean, he's got to kill MJF in this match. That's the key. That's MJF's got a gig. Yes. He's got to be bleeding. He's got to be near death. And finally, like something happens, but, you know, Wardlow throws the ring in, but Cody gets a hold of it, and the ref's down, or the ref's back is turned, and pa bam! It could even be like Arn has the ref. Because, like, eventually, like, you feel Arn's got to turn on Cody or something. But whatever. Cody's got to waffle him with that ring, and the ref turns around, and he sees the ring, and he calls for the first DQ in the history of AEW, and he raises the bloody, unconscious hand of MJF, and MJF is declared the winner. Yes. I feel like it would work. I think we're great. I think we're great. The, the, this, I don't think this is the end of the feud coming up. No, in this can't be. It's out. too good. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very confident MJF is going to win somehow. I think having him get the tainted victory by shitty DQ in a match where he is absolutely ripped to shreds. This is yes. the key. This is the key. You he have, must be destroyed. Yes. It has to be Shawn Michaels at hell, at hell of a Cell. Yes. He wins, but the fans got to see him get his ass kicked. Yes. So, it's all very exciting. It now, is. Now, technically, technically, that is the end of Dynamite. But after the match was over, after Cody knew they were on the air, Cody Rhodes cut a promo. He sure did. Thus far, this is only available on Twitter. It's all over the place on Twitter. It's not hard to find. If anyone running this company has a brain, and clearly many of them do, this promo or these parts of it will be shown many times on Dynamite this upcoming Wednesday because this promo was unbelievable. He alerts the fans, Dynamite has gone off the air. Now, he's just had his match. He's still covered in blood. He's sweaty, but he's also a great athlete. So he's, caught, he's caught his breath. He's composed himself. He asks the fans to please stick around for three great matches on AEW Dark. Asks for a round of applause for everyone who helped get this show off the ground. All the cameramen and women, all the production crew, the arena staff, the security, everyone who helps make AE Dynam- AEW Dynamite go. Says so they're here in Atlanta. It was about 200 yards away from this place on Baker Street when I, when I fell in love with wrestling. I was eight years old. I knew my dad was famous. I didn't really know why. I didn't grow up in his prime. He turns to Arn. I never saw you and your friends break his leg. But I was at a show, and I watched Sting go out of the building, and you all gave him a great reception, he says. The fans applaud themselves. And I started to walk out of the building, and Dad stopped me. And told me an important lesson. Never steal another man's pop. And they let Sting go out and get his reception. And then Dusty and Cody left the building. And and Cody's choking up. Talking about the love the fan showed for his father. It went, you know, 25 years ago, whatever it was. And then in 2007, at age 15, he debuted in Atlanta. And the fans were very hard on him. And he appreciated that because they were the ones who motivated him to come back and get better. They're in Atlanta, the home of Turner and Warner Media. He thanks them for extending Dynamite for three more years. He guarantees they'll be back in Atlanta someday. What a textbook promo this was. This hit all the boxes. It was so awesome. It was like the best promo I've seen all year by anyone. It was great. 
So we got like five minutes or less left. So very quickly, I just got to say that between the Cody promo and of all things, the wrestlers getting their action figures, this is the kind of thing that this company needs to do. Because when you saw those wrestlers getting their action figures and they were so excited about it. Yes. And they were out of character. And when you see Cody cut his promo in tears and you see fans in tears, the thing that you're getting from AEW that you absolutely are not getting from WWE today is it's a bunch of people that you feel like are real, yes. nice people. Believable, likable characters. That you No, not even characters. They're actual nice people. Sure. And you want to support what they're doing. Yeah. Whereas, and listen... There are so many nice people in WWE and great human beings, but if you're a fan, what you feel like as a fan is they're your enemy. They're constantly giving you stuff that you don't want to see. They're pushing people that you don't want to see pushed. They're not pushing people that you do want to see pushed. It feels like you're constantly at war with them as a fan. In AEW, it feels like they're on your side. They want to give you what you want. And what they want in return is for you to support them. That's what is working for this company. Yeah. And they need to keep it up. Yes. Cody's unbelievable. Uh, AEW wins this week. AEW wins. Uh, last week I said it was NXT was not five times worse than AEW, or AEW was not five times the show NXT was. It was this week. Five yes. times better. It was incredible I want to go back and take away some of my old NXT votes from prior weeks. Oh, Vinny, get out of here. Yeah. So that's it, everybody. we got to wrap it up. Retro Raw Nitro on Tuesday. Another one of the... However... There's another show to discuss. Yes. AEW Dynamite, February 26th, 2020. Tonight, a run down the card. This is the go-home show for AEW Revolution. We will see the best friends versus the Butcher and the Blade. There's a women's four-way match. The Inner Circle versus Jurassic Express in a trios match. The weigh-in for the AEW title match at the pay-per-view. And our opener, Kenny Omega versus Pac in an Iron Man match. Where to begin? Well, we can begin by saying that we got our first ever DQ in the history of AEW. There is a point to this. Which I think is very noteworthy because that means it is exceedingly unlikely yes. that they're doing my DQ finish for MJF and Cody. That does lower the odds of that significantly. Now, there was a reason for this because the score was still 0-0. Zero, zero. It was about 50 minutes into the match. And Pac just grabs a chair and waffles him for the DQ to go down 0-1. to one. Then he immediately runs wild, hits his finish, gets the pin to even it at 1-1, one, one, and then he is in control for the next 10 minutes. A tactical move on uh, Pac's part eventually paid off. Now, the two men come out. Kenny Omega is accompanied not by his co-holder of the tag team titles, Hangman Page, but by his friends, the Young Bucks. And this is actually explained later in the show. They did have the clock up in the big screen, but because the fans cared about the match and who were and uh, who was in it, they did not just do a countdown every ten seconds to go three, two, one, eh, like that one the last time WWE did an Iron Man match. I think it was Seth and Dolph, something like that. So, <laughs> the match is like three and a half minutes old, and Omega does this big giant dive and smashes his tailbone on the ground, and it's so bad for his tailbone. Even Excalibur is talking about it. There's a Asai moonsault into a DDT in the floor. Eight minutes in, Pac grabs Omega and does a top rope brain buster. It's like the greatest wrestling move I've ever seen in my okay. life. <laughs> listen, listen. I loved, loved, loved this match. But how in God's name do you do a top rope brain buster and it's not a finish? I don't have an answer to that one. Like that's a flaw. That is a flaw in the match. If I'm Tony Khan, I, he probably didn't go over the match with him. But if I'm Tim Flowers and these guys tell me we're doing a top rope brain brain, it's like fuck off. You're not doing a fucking top rope brain buster. It was not like in Japan where you do a suplex, but they call it a brain buster. Yeah, and it wasn't even like it was a middle rope brain buster. No, he was all the fucking way on the top rope. He lifted the guy straight up in the air, and he gave him a brain. Buster in the fucking middle of the ring. Yeah. The fans chant, holy shit, you killed Kenny. I'm like, he didn't kill Kenny. He fucking killed Kenny Omega. 
and it wasn't a fall. You're not going to pin off it. They just kept wrestling. They did. And like of all of the other moves, Tiger Driver 98, One Winged Angel, whatever, there was nothing on this fucking planet that I've ever seen as fucking crazy as a top rope brain buster, and they just kept wrestling. So that was the first thing in this match I may never forget. We have flurry of knee strikes and a double underhook pile driver for a near fall. That's 13 minutes in. There's a jumping German suplex, a fall away power bomb, and a V trigger. And at this point, the announcers are saying the, the announcer's point is that for all these, it's 15 minutes of big moves, and yet no one has been pinned yet, which is shocking. And while that is a good point, more impressive to me was 15 minutes have already gone by. You know, you know how sometimes we'll do an old Nitro or an old Raw, and we'll say that promo had to be 20 minutes. How was that promo only four minutes? Yes. This was the opposite. Well, this felt like three time minutes. Time flies by. when you're having fun. When Vinny. you're watching something good. Yes. That's this a, 15 minutes. That I've, still works in 2020. By the end, all 30 plus minutes had flown by. So they do the chair shot spot pretty much right in the middle of the match, basically. Uh, DQ and then the black arrow pin. So it's 1 1 with 13 minutes and change to go. So they go to commercial after that pinfall. Nothing's happening in their commercial break. And I was actually watching this live. So. I was worried nothing happened to the commercial break. And then, like, the instant they come back from commercial, fighting in the apron, and one of them, I have noticed looking at the clock just to make sure they were back live. And they're fighting the apron, and Pat goes to the Falcon Arrow. And you got to understand from the, from the camera angle, they're shooting this from the hard cam, and it appears he's going to drop him on the apron, which was a surely a violent enough move. But I'm prepared for I'm prepared for that to happen. And then they get to apron level and just keep falling. Because they didn't go to the apron. They went to the floor. And Kenny went flat back on the floor, bounced off the pretty black mats. Just brutal. All I could think was, this dude has another match in the pay-per-view in three days. <laughs> well, he's fine. Good. So what I noticed is, after the Brain Buster, the fans chanted, holy shit. Yeah. And after the Falcon Arrow off the apron, they chanted, holy shit. Mm -hmm. So, the first holy shit chant, they chanted it. The second one got bleeped. That's true. That okay? is true, yes. Now, this is an important point here, all right? Because believe it or not, this is true. Yeah. I need to get clarification on exactly what it is, but there's a shit rule on AEW. I think, I think it's one shit per hour. It may be one shit per show. Not pretty... I think it's one an hour. There was though. another one after this. The, yes, later. there was one in the second hour. Yeah. So I think you're allowed to say shit one time per hour on AEW. And the funny thing is, apparently the fans chanting holy shit, that took away their shit for the hour. Because the second time they chanted it, it got bleeped. Yes. It applies to the fans as well, which is the amazing thing. This is the kind of thing that I love about pro wrestling. <laughs> being able to talk about things like that. So... The, the doctor is out there. Apparently, the AEW doctor's name is Doc Samson. Oh, yeah. Which is a... a, a Doc Samson. Yeah. Which is a, a huge rib on comic book fans. That's it's his name. Even better. Yeah. <laughs> Britt Baker it. mentions him regularly. I'll pay more attention to that then. There's a shooting star pressed through a table on the floor. Just spectacular. They tease the double Except counter. for the landing. Pac on his fucking knees. I thought he just broke his back in two. There's a uh, double count out tease off of that, and Pac is furious when Kenny makes it back in, and also that the Bucks helped Kenny back in. A borderline disqualification. They, they helped their friend get back in the ring. So Pac goes for another black arrow. Kenny gets the knees up, and if you watch this, Pac lands on his feet, and then his belly hits Omega's knees, but then his forehead hits the mat really hard. Looks very un uncomfortable. There's a Yarnagi for a near fall, a Poison Rana for a near fall, and with about three minutes left, Pat gets the Brutalizer, and the place is going nuts. There's an epic battle for the ropes. Omega finally gets it with about two minutes to go, and everyone just, yay, they're all cheery and happy, and Pac, of course, does the brilliant thing, just drags him right to the middle of the ring, puts him back in the Brutalizer. You know, it's just like, this is great strategy. You're damn sure right it is. So we're now 29 minutes into a 30-minute Iron Man match. We're having an epic struggle as Pac is battling to secure this hold and Omega's trying to, to avoid it. 
He gets it. Omega escapes by pinching Pac's nose, cutting off his air. Pac has to release the hold so he can get his catch his breath back. He goes right back to the hold, but the clock expires. It's one to one. Pac is furious. He levels the referee. And then this it's- led to my favorite line, maybe of Excalibur's life. When with total sincerity he says, It's not Turner's fault, it's time's fault. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. I didn't catch that. <laughs> I was dying. I rewound it to make sure I heard it right. <laughs> it's not Turner's fault. It's Time's fault. So it's announced that they will go to sudden death, and Aubrey will be the referee. And of course, that's... Ah, oh, minor faux pas. Ah, they shouldn't have sent out Aubrey. Because they sent her out, and like, a... she was all of a sudden the center of attention. They're, take... they're chanting for her in this sudden death. It's over time. Well, yeah, the sudden death was not what I would have done. Uh, Kenny, as soon as the bell rings, opens with a V-trigger. Hits the, uh, I think it's pronounced Kamigoye. Yep. It's, it's, it's Ibushi's move. Because no matter where they are in the world and where they are working, Omega and Ibushi, Ibushi will be teasing something with each other. The Golden Lovers will always be a thing. And Pack kicked out of that, but then Omega hit that one-winged angel, and that finished him. So here's the downside to the overtime. Sending Aubrey out stole the spotlight off the wrestlers. It was a one-sided slaughter in overtime, and it was kind of an anticlimactic finish compared to just doing a finish right at the 30-second mark or whatever. That's the downside. The upside is, it's the same thing that happened with the Iron Man match with the Bret and Sean at Mania. One guy, the score was tied, and one guy had a submission when the time expired. That guy went on to lose in overtime. He can legitimately say, fucker, I had you beat. You were saved by the bell. I got screwed. So they can that can feed yeah, into they, a rematch. They, one guy had the win. But the key is, even though he had the win, the rules were it was a 30-minute time limit. So that's it. Well, if that was that's it, it should have the overtime then. Well, no. The point is, like, he didn't achieve the goal in 30 minutes. So the sudden death overtime is a sudden death overtime. Once that's decided, that's decided. And then the other guy decisively beat the other guy. He certainly did. So this was not, like, you could say this is 50-50, but I didn't see it that way. Both guys over huge. They gave something to both guys. The finish certainly didn't hurt Kenny Omega. It oh, God, didn't, no. it, it didn't hurt Pa. If I implied that, I apologize. No, no. <laughs> it was great. No. Yeah, no, we, we, we certainly had a decisive winner. In the end, on this night, Omega was clearly the better man going to his tag title match at the pay-per-view, and we'll talk about that later. But uh, no, this is, if I have not made it clear, this is like the best TV match I've seen in years. Yes, I hear that too. Is that a tea kettle going off? What is that? The cameras? It's in the room. It's not on the headset. It went away. There's a cream, scream, crying. Well, the baby is. It's another man entirely. Yeah. Yes. All right. Hey. Well, anyway. Yeah, if I'm not made it clear, that was the best TV match I've seen in I don't even know how long. I saw people saying that was better than anything New Japan did in the Tokyo Dome, and I wouldn't go that far, but God. What a great wrestling match. It was clearly one of the great matches in AEW history. It was one of the best things easy to one, say. one of the best things you will ever see on a free TV show. And uh, if somehow you missed it, I encourage you to seek out this show using whatever means you can find and watch this match. It's glorious and wonderful. So afterwards, Shivani interviews Pac. Now, I don't know who wrote Tony's question for him, but he was a complete dick. A complete and total dickbag. Essentially, he says, this is the biggest match of your career, the biggest match of your life, and you lost. Well, he says, all that talk and you lost. I see. Oh, I see. Pac did not want to hear that. Tony's lucky I don't that blame Orange, him. Orange Cassidy came out because he was, he was en route to being killed. So Pac asks, are you taking the piss? Is this a joke? Before he can are murder... You taking the piss? It's a British thing. I know. I loved yeah. it. Yeah. Before he can murder Tony on live TV, Orange Cassidy comes out to make the save. Orange gets in Pac's face, and Pac is just so stunned he can't even react that of all people, Orange Cassidy is, is here to, to make the save. And Orange, for the first time in AEW history, removes his own sunglasses. So you know he means business. And then Pac decks him and levels him and leaves him down. It was great, and the guy would get greater, greater later. The thing I couldn't figure out was, why did Orange Cassidy come out? Well, to 
because they had a match to set up. <laughs> I know, but like Orange Cassidy, ninety nine percent of the time when something happens, it's like, oh, I know why that happened. It didn't. This was absolutely completely random. Orange Cassidy was the random babyface closest out there to make sure Pac didn't kill Tony on live TV because Tony asked a stupid question. Lexi is outside the Painmaker Posse locker room. Now I don't know if this is a one night joke for the for the weigh in angle. They're still selling Inner Circle merchandise, so I assume Inner Circle is still still their name. But for one night, the nickname for the Inner Circle was the Painmaker Posse. Dude, when I saw the Painmaker Posse and the track suits and everything, I was like, if only he thought of this first. That's some marketable stuff right there. I guess they could be both. I guess they'll be both. They're the Inner Circle and the Painmaker Posse. That, there's a, I maybe an Inner Circle shirt. They 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 came with a Guns N' Roses parody shirt with skulls of all of them on the thing. Anyway. She's there to interview them. Of course, they send out Jake Hager, who just looks in the camera and doesn't see anything and then dismisses them. Proud and Powerful and Sammy Guevara versus the Jurassic Express. What a fun match this was. Taz is on commentary. I guess Tony's shaken up by Pac nearly killing him. They had a very fun uh, trios match, very fun TV trios match. Luchasaurus got a hot tag, and he makes a big comeback. It's all great. And they get Sammy Guevara in the ring, and they hit him with 7,000 finishing moves. <laughs> they kick him, yeah. they slam him, they throw him down, they, they slam him. So what you do in your six-man splash team. Splash him, and then it all got broken up. <laughs> so the finish is, there's a big melee going on. Sammy gets a hold of the mad ball, the, 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 the baseball and the sock, whatever's in there, cue ball, whatever's in there. But before he can swing it, Darby Allen appears, takes it away. Sammy is distracted, and Jungle Boy hits him with a Rana and pinned him. This is all you could hope for. I just loved it because the booking of all of these matches, it's like, okay, who could use a win here? Jungle Boy. He needs another mm, win. Yeah. Well, how can we set it up? Well, Sammy's going to come out here, and he's going to, uh, or Darby's going to come out, he's going to screw Sammy. That sets up the match at the pay-per-view. It gives Jungle Boy the win. Mm -hmm. Like it was, and you can do Jungle Boy and Sammy down the road, revenge, whatever. And it was a fun match. Lots of high flying, lots of utilizing everybody. Like, there's stuff that Jungle Boy does great. There's stuff that Marco does great. There's stuff that Luchasaurus does great. And there's stuff that all three of them aren't great at. So you highlight the things that each of them are good yeah. at, and away you go. One of the great things about teams. They have one guy do half of the job, have the other guy do the other half of the job, and if that's the half they're good at, good at they all look better. So I was watching this show live, which I never do. But I was watching this show live, and an hour had already gone by. Now, keep in mind, I was live. Dude, this show flies by. I couldn't skip commercials. No. Yeah. So this had actually this hour actually took like 20 minutes longer than most hours I watch on AEW, but it still flew by. So if you haven't gotten the message yet, this is an incredible TV show. Have an MGF, MJF Cody video. Explain the whole thing. They were friends. MJF turned on him. They did the turn. They explained the steps. They showed the lashing. They showed the cage. They showed the moonsault. They showed everything. They're having a match on Saturday. This ruled. And they weren't on the show. That was it. Yeah. Because my my theory was that MGF had to try to get Cody to hit him. And that can't happen if they're not on the show. Yeah. And I'm fine with that. Like, if they would have been on the show and not done that, I would have been upset. But them not being on the show, they're not on the show. That's it. MJF had weeks to try to get the guy to hit him. That's also and true. And he didn't. That's also true. Best Friends versus Butcher and Blade. So it's kind of funny watching this show because they every the the TV match of the year was the opener. And on the one hand, everyone had to follow that. And of course, it was impossible. No one could. On the other hand, the show was already guaranteed to be a good show. So they were playing with house money. They had like nothing to lose in any of these matches. Well, that and, you know, I love all the matches on, on NXT, but NXT can very much be, there's a great match in the opener, and all of the other matches are actually trying to follow it, yeah. because they're all trying to be great WWE NXT style matches. And in AEW, yeah, the opening match was like fantastic, but there was not one other match on the show that was trying to do what that match did. No. You had a six-man tag with flips and dives. You have this match with the Butcher, the Blade, and Orange Cassidy, and the Bunny doing spots. The women's match, totally different. And then you had a weigh-in. 
Like there was nothing that was trying to follow that. That's match. a good point. That's a good point. So the only thing they had a fine little TV tag match here. The only thing that got any reaction was when Bunny and Orange had their showdown, and they're having a stare down. She takes his glasses. He takes her bunny ears, puts his hands in his pockets. It's a big dive, and the best friends pin the butcher with a foot stomp cradle tombstone. Pin the blade. You're right. Butcher was really big. That'd be weird. Yeah. I like how he still correct my notes. So then Tony. With the best friends... It's history, Vinny. Someday you may go back to these notes. Sure. Tony, after the match, is in the ring with the best friends in Orange Cassidy, and he has a major announcement. He sure does. Which is, in fact, at a revolution, in a singles match, Pack versus Orange Cassidy. So the best friends, because Orange Cassidy's gimmick is he's mute, all he ever does is give you thumbs up, the best friends cut a promo on his behalf. And Chucky <laughs> did such a great promo for Orange when he says, Pack, you think this guy is nothing but a joke? Well, the joke's on you because this time he's going to try. <laughs> a fans <laughs> chant, he's going to try. He's going to try. And, it's awesome. then, and, of course, Cassidy doesn't sell this at all. No, he doesn't sell anything. But, of course, then, Trent has to clarify, he never actually told us this. We think he's going to try. And so Tony just goes to Orange and says, what do you have to say? And Orange just slowly lifts that half thumb. And that's the whole build. Orange, Cassidy versus Pack. Fabulous. It's going to be awesome. It will be. And I guarantee you, like nothing else on that show. It will definitely be... Like, I'm not the only one who did this match with Orange, but they got to do the match that I did with Orange. Uh, as far as I know, everyone has done that match with Which, them. well, I mean, Orange Maybe has done a Jervis couple of matches Cottonelli. where he just like... No, he's done some matches where it's comedy like all the way through. But it's got to start where he's trying to fuck around and it makes Pac more and more upset. And finally, Pac starts to beat the shit out of him. And then Orange fires up and tries... And does the big-ass comeback, and away we go. Yeah. This is not a complicated story. No, this is easy. And Pac is the perfect guy to do this with him, too. Yes. It's going to be awesome. Yuka Sakazaki versus Big Swole versus Shauna versus Hikaru Shida. It's just a random four-way. Uh, tornado rules all four in the match. There's a little bit of comedy with Sakazaki at the beginning where she gets herself, she got herself over with a lot of cute comedy spots and then running wild in everyone. Eventually, they just cut her off. There's a big parade of moves. Some of them look good. Some of them didn't. Eventually, Sheeta pins Swole with a running knee. I thought Swole actually looked best in this match, as far as the actual wrestling goes. Really? Yeah. But, I don't know if I'd go that far. But uh, it was fine. I did, I did add here, there was so much going on, I could be wrong. The Dark Order do a promo. The Exalted One is near. He has given us our assignments. Eva Luno and Stu Grayson which I can't believe is still the character's name. They will face SCU at Revolution. Scorpio Sky and Frankie Kazarian, you are in for a rough night. And as for you, Christopher Daniels, you will learn that you are obsolete. This is the best story because they give so many red herrings, so many clues, and there's so many different ways they can go with it. And it's awesome. And there's that one issue, though, if they can't get Matt Hardy. Then there'll be somebody else. Yeah, but, but people the, the really, point is, really want it to be Matt Hardy. They do, they do. But there's so many wrestling stories. I mean, well, there's so many stories with a very obvious finish, and the finish, finish is obvious all the way through. And they're doing a great job of throwing out different ideas this person could be, and it actually could be any of them. Yes, but here's the point, Vinny. Mm -hmm. Like, it was going to be Marty Skrull. Right. Then he went to Ring of Honor. It will not be him. Okay. Now, nobody knew it was going to be Marty Skrull, but like... If people were expecting Marty Skrull, and then he gets signed, you have to have somebody that the fans will find equal or better than Marty Skrull. Yes. Okay. So now everybody's expecting Matt Hardy, as broken Matt Hardy, as the exalted one, which is fucking perfect. If you don't get Matt Hardy, like, I don't think it can be the hangman. I don't think it can be Kenny Omega. I don't know who it could be, but like there's an expectation now. Yeah. And if it doesn't end up being Matt, because of that expectation, they've got to find somebody that when people find out who it is, they're like, oh my God, that's even better than Matt Hardy. Yes. 
Yeah, they, they, they and are, I don't know who that guy is. They may be it in a ain't tough Raven. Spot here. No. It's not Daniels, I don't think. I don't think it's, yeah, Chris Daniels at this point. Yeah. But we'll see how it plays out. So earlier today, Jim Ross is a sit down interview with the Bucks, Kenny Omega, and Heyman Page. <laughs> so, like, the very first thing Matt says is he never thought when they started AEW that he'd be sitting over here and those two would be the tag team champions. And Paige is already miffed. Of course you wouldn't. Yeah. Starts drinking. Starts drinking. But but Matt says, you're my best friends. I'm very proud of you. Then Omega says, I know. I never planned this either. Now Paige is even more angry. So you're saying I'm just a big accident, he says. Well, Kenny's line is, the Young Bucks are the best tag team in the world. We were just right place, right time. Yes. Now Hangman's angry. I'm just an accident. Kenny tries to laugh it off because he realizes, oh, fuck. That was not a great line. So Ross notes Paige is uncomfortable, asks him why he's uncomfortable. And then Matt says, yeah, why are you uncomfortable? And why did you bring that drink? Paige and I is being uncomfortable. And they all talk about how they've, they'll be facing guys on Saturday. They see more than their own family. They love each other. They're best friends. You'll get the competitive version of the Bucks, but we'll be friends no matter what. And eventually, Paige can take no more of this. He feels slighted by everything that gets said. They're not taking him seriously. They're not taking him seriously as a champion. They're not taking him seriously as a threat on Saturday. And he, he, he there, there's uh, one of the Bucks is thinking about whoever wins the elite will be the tag belts. Tag, tag will be the tag team champs. And so Paige doesn't react well to that. He holds up, holds up and says, "Who's carrying these? The elite? I try to leave the elite. You wouldn't let me." And now the buck snap. You were a jobber in Ring of Honor until we brought you into the Elite in the Bullet Club. And so Paige is pissed. This is the biggest biggest accomplishment of my career. It means that little to you. You know what? My drink is empty. I'm going to leave. He walks off. The Bucks are appalled that he's not there to promote their match. Kenny is caught between the two sides. He's just trying to curl up into a ball and disappear. This was great. And, of course... This explains why the Bucks and not Paige were there with Omega in the opener. So, this was just the greatest. This is like the greatest interview I ever saw. But Every video they've done with Paige has well, been the best. Well, what this was, I deliberately do not watch Being the Elite. Because I don't want... How can I say this? I want to know what they are and are not properly explaining on television. Yes. Okay. So this was a masterpiece because if you never watched a single being the elite in your life, including the one where the hangman quit the elite, this explained everything. And what was great about it was there was not only was this thing not scripted, but they they didn't even do a run through. They all sat in their chairs. They got Jim Ross there and they said, go. And they did it. You want to know why? Because every single person here absolutely completely understands their character and what's going on. Hangman knows, Omega knows, the Young Bucks know, and they just turned on the fucking camera and they improv this whole skit right here. As thinking about this today, when I really think about why this show is so great and why Raw and SmackDown and to a lesser degree, NXT are not this great. And the answer is, we've said it a million times, but the answer is, you remember when we were little kids and you'd say, well, the thing with pro wrestling is, it's fake. You have to be able to suspend your disbelief. Right? Yeah. Do you know how easy it is to suspend your disbelief when you watch AEW? It's automatic. And do you know how fucking impossible it is to suspend your disbelief particularly when you're watching Raw and SmackDown. They had, that Lace, they had a Lacey Evans interview, which was supposed to be like this, and it was a fucking nightmare. Like, the, the questions were fake. The answers were fake. Like, everything about it. The, the verbiage is fake. It's so fake that you, you actually cannot suspend your disbelief. Right. It's not like if you want to, you can. You can't suspend your disbelief watching Raw and SmackDown. But on AEW, it's so easy to suspend your disbelief. You want to know why? Because there's enough reality on the show that 
you're not taken out of it constantly. What on Raw, SmackDown, NXT, what is ever real? Very little. We get a little of it in NXT. Actually, we get a lot more in NXT. Like Ciampa talks about his neck surgery and... You know, Gargano talks about injury. I mean, there's real stuff on NXT, but on the main roster, everything down to the questions that the robots ask, yes. it's all scripted, and you can't buy any of it. You want to know my analogy? Yes, Brian. That's what we're here for, to know things. I had a relative, and I don't even remember who it was. It might have been my I think it was my grandpa. He's been dead since 1986, so I couldn't ask him. But when... When his kids were little, when Santa was coming, he would actually get a pair of boots. This is back when you had actual fireplaces. Yeah. And he would put the boots in the ashes, and he would walk footprints to where the toys were Mm. and back. So imagine if you're a kid, and you're kind of thinking, I don't really, I'm not sure about this whole Santa thing. But you're still willing to believe. If someone goes out of their way to do that little thing, there's real footprints going to the toys. How easy it is to spend your disbelief when you're a kid that Santa came down that fucking chimney. Now what WWE is, is WWE is grandpa taking you to Target and saying, well, pick out what you want, and I'm going to put it in your stocking for Santa on Christmas. Okay? There's no fucking way to suspend your disbelief. You know what I'm saying? That's the difference here. Wrestling is not real. It's not. I hate to break it to you. It's fake, okay? It's not real. But that doesn't mean that every last fucking single solitary thing on the show has to be fake. You know what I mean? (laughs) Make it as real as you possibly can, and then fucking work the matches and decide who's going to win. And have everything else be as real as you can get it. Then you got something. That's what AEW is doing. In WWE, the whole shebang is fake. There ain't nothing that's real. I love this interview. They run down the card for Revolution. Here here it is, the the full full shebang, as you said. MJF versus Cody. The Young Bucks versus Kenny Omega and Hangman Page for the tag titles. Nyla Rose versus Chris Statlander for the women's title. Pac versus Orange Cassidy. Dustin Rhodes versus Jake Hager, Darby Allen versus Sammy Guevara, and your main event, John Moxley versus Chris Jericho for the AEW World Heavyweight Championship. Then next week, it's Revolution Aftermath in Denver. And then we have a major announcement. Lance Archer has arrived in All Elite Wrestling. Yes. I assume debuting next week. We'll see. But if they have signed the big man. And it's time for the weigh-in. They, they bring in, as they called him, the world's most dangerous announcer, Gary Michael Capetta. Mosley comes through the crowd. And he's wearing a sleeveless hoodie and shorts. And I was kind of baffled. I remembered, well, it is a weigh-in. He's wearing, wearing as little as possible. Jericho comes out with a painmaker posse. It's the inner circle in matching track suits doing a goddamn Gracie chain to the ring in 2020. It was awesome. My heart melted. <laughs> so beautiful. I wanted one of these track suits. I don't buy any merch. <laughs> That's a sweet track suit there. Jericho insists John Moxley goes first. So Moxley steps on the scale, weighs in at 234 pounds. Jericho is about to get on the scale, and of course he's dragging out and delaying it as much as he can. Well, I don't know if he did this on purpose or not, but he steps on the scale, but he's holding this fucking giant belt. He's got the big, he's got his shoes on, he's got his whole yeah. track suit on. But the point is, yes, yeah, his heavy, heavy belt. Yes. And, you know, he's like, ah, well, yeah, it's going to add 40 pounds. Of course he did this on purpose. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand this to, uh, to Sammy here. So he, he hands over the belt, but then... Now he's concerned about the weight of his sunglasses. <laughs> take the sunglasses off. So he has, to take, he has to get off. He doesn't just take the sunglasses off. He has to get off the scale. Yeah. Take off his sunglasses. Get on the scale. And then, oh, my fucking scarf. Get off. Yes, yes. It's, Did you notice, by the way, he was wearing, I don't know if this is on purpose or not, his shoes exactly blended in with the carpet. So from certain camera angles, he just appeared to have no feet. So, I don't think he did that on purpose, but maybe so, he did. So the crowd starts to boo him. They're in Kansas City. He tells... The Kansas City fans, yes, they won the Super Bowl. Get over it. So, of course, they start booing even louder. Then he grabs the mic. 
and I don't know if he did this on purpose or not, but if I he, would guess that he did. It's a gimmick. He says, Aaron Mahomes is a piece of shit. Yes. <laughs> Neil Boo. Now, Brian, I don't know if you're aware. I know that's not his name. His name is Patrick Mahomes. Yes. Aaron's the other guy. So, of course, they boo even louder. And finally, Moxley can take no more. Headbutts Jericho right between the eyes, and I do mean right between the eyes. Blood pours everywhere. The inner circle kills Moxley. Dustin runs out to brawl with Hager. They brawl everywhere. Jericho comes to, still covered in blood, but he swarms in the beating on Moxley. Hager and Dustin are brawling out in the uh, the, the, the concourse. They brawl into the dipping Dots. Darby is there to attack Sammy, but Darby already got heat on Sammy, so this time it's Sammy's turn. Sammy catches him coming in, breaks the skateboard over his head. And then Jericho and... I don't know what happened to Proud and Powerful, actually. I missed where they went. But Jericho and Moxley are having their big brawl. And it ends with Jericho grabbing Moxley, hitting Moxley's own finish, the paradigm shift onto the scale. And Jericho is standing triumphant as the go-home show goes off the air. In World Wrestling Entertainment, this would be a rock-solid guarantee that Moxley's winning the title of the pay-per-view. We'll see what happens in all elite wrestling. This is a perfect wrestling show. Oh, it was awesome. What a go-home show this was. How many times we've seen go-home shows from WWE, and it's like, that's the go-home show? Yeah. This was a go-home show. And you know what I liked about it? It's They have a two-hour show, and they didn't try to get every major match on the show. No, Cody and MGF went on. The MGF, Cody, go-home show was... Well, their go-home show was last week. Sure. So... Some of the big matches last week was a go-home show, and the other big matches this week was a go-home Chris, show. Chris and Nyla were not on the show. They were last week. Yep, they were on the show. Cody and MJF were on the show. Great. This is a two-hour show that went all two hours. It yes. wasn't a three-hour show stepped into two hours. It wasn't a 90-minute show stretched out over two hours. The show went exactly as long as it should have been. I'm voting AEW this week, Brian. Well, I would say that AEW is the winner this week. An excellent show. Not just an excellent go-home show, but an excellent professional wrestling yeah, show. Yeah, this is what I... If, hey, if we had this show every week for the rest of the year, this would be the best show ever. Well, dude, we've had something close to this. And frankly, January yeah, they're on a roll. <laughs> they're they're on an absolute roll. This, this is eight straight weeks of great shows, if I recall correctly. I believe so, yeah. This is very, very good. All right, that's it, everybody. We're going to wrap it up for today. we got a lot of... St- we watched All Elite Wrestling Revolution, February 29th, 2020. We sure did. Boy, did we. We have a lot to talk about with this show. First of all, the opener, Dustin Rhodes versus Jake Hager. A strange choice for an opener. It's Jake Hager's debut. We've all seen him wrestle before. And it's Jack Swagger with a new name in an AEW ring. It's very slow. He uses a lot of arm holds. The crowd really does not like it when he does his arm holds. And for long stretches of, the, of this match, when he's doing nothing, he's doing completely, absolutely nothing. Now, the good news is Dustin Rhodes is a tremendous baby face. So whenever he fires up out of a submission hold or makes his comeback, the crowd fires up again, and it's great. The weirdest thing about this match is all of a sudden, Jake Hager has a hot wife. I'm sure he's had her for a while, but they never talked about her on TV one time. Now she's in the front row. They're making out before the match. The camera's cutting to her every single time. And then at a random point in the match, she's flirting with her husband. And Dustin comes over and knocks Hager down and starts making out with the wife. Well, it wasn't that she was flirting with him. I mean, she was she was giving him advice as a corner person from the front row. Like, she's telling him what to do in this match to take out Dustin. This allowed Dustin to run up and wipe out Jake Hager. And next thing you know, in 2020, Dustin Rhodes is kissing Jake Hager's wife against her will. Yeah. That was bizarre. She had done nothing. I think there might have been a slap in there, if I recall correctly. Was there not? I don't think there was. Yeah, she hadn't done anything. I don't, I don't believe that she did it at yeah. that point. So. I mean, still, I mean, if you slap someone, you don't deserve to be sexually assaulted, Vinny. Well, I'm not saying that, but at least it would have been something to instigate this. There was no instigation whatsoever yeah. for this assault. That was strange. So the match continues. It's right on the verge of starting to drag and go go too long. There's a tease of, of a ref bump, uh, which is notable because it's Audrey, uh, Aubrey, and bumping her would be a big deal. They did not bump her, but she was distracted, which allowed Hager to hit a low blow and hook the standing head and arm choke, which is apparently his MMA finisher, we've been told. And he hooks this choke, and I think, okay, this is gone long enough, and this is a good, this is a fine finish. And Dustin starts to fight and fire up out of this, and I was about to turn on this match. It has gone, it overstayed its welcome. They did all they had to do. They can just end it now. And they did, in fact, just end it now, because Dustin struggled a little bit, 
then went out and lost. So it was not a bad match. It was a little slow, and I maintain a strange choice for an opener. Yeah, it was a little weird. I mean, in the old days, the opener, the opener and the main event are the two most important matches on the show. That's the way it used to be. But the idea wasn't so much that the opener was supposed to be, like, trying to steal the show, try to be one of the best matches on the show. Mm -hmm. The opener just sets the pace for the entire show. Yes. It doesn't have to be, like, a main event style match. It just has to, it just has to get the people going, get them excited, get them primed for the show, and away we go. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's accomplished this a little bit when Dustin made his comeback. But in general, like as a match, it was a weird choice to open up this show. Yes. And, I mean, you never know what's going to happen. I mean, you have no idea how the crowd's going to react. You have no idea how over or not over Jake Hager's going to be in his first match. It was his first match. They had nothing to base anything on, except that he used to be this character in WWE, and they're trying to separate him from that character. But it was fine. As I mentioned yesterday, my big criticism is Dustin setting up for Shattered Dreams and Hager sitting straddled on the middle rope. And Aubrey stops Dustin. She says, no, you may not do this move. You can't do this move. And as she's trying to stop him from doing the move, Hager gets his legs out, so he frees himself. But then Dustin runs up right in front of Aubrey and kicks him in the balls. That was not a DQ. Yeah, it was a strange. So match. then later, like like a minute or two later, Hager has to distract Aubrey to kick the guy in the balls. So, I mean, is a kick to the balls legal if you're a babyface and illegal if you're a heel? Or was Aubrey just in the wrong position for Dustin and saw something she wasn't supposed to see and just let it go? One way or the other, the thing I'll say about this show up and down the show is the first few weeks of AEW, the refereeing was a disaster. And we railed about the refereeing and how these referees, like, I don't care. I've said it a million times. I don't care what the rules are. I just want to know what the rules are. And I want whatever the rules are, I want them to be enforced. And after a while, they really buckled down on the refereeing and the tag rope and all of that stuff. And this show, whoosh, out the window. We had refs letting anything go. Yeah. We had, we'll get to it. We had, like, the Young Bucks were in the ring for, like, five minutes to the point where Jim Ross starts screaming, can we get one of these guys out of the ring? So I don't know what happened, but this happened. We have an ad for Dynamite. They're doing a double ring, single cage around both rings with a roof match, which they are apparently calling Blood and Guts. Yes. Brilliant. Yeah. That's awesome. That's coming. Uh, I didn't get the date. sometime in March. Two rings, one cage. You know the rest. That's what it said. Well, I do know the rest. We do know the rest. And frankly, m- the vast, vast majority of AEW fans will know the rest. Tonight on this show, Nyla Rose defends the women's title against Chris Statlander. The Young Bucks challenge Kenny, pa- uh, Kenny Omega and Hangman Page for the tag titles. Orange Cassidy makes his in-ring debut against Pac. Cody faces MJF. And in the main event... John Moxley challenges Chris Jericho for the AEW world title. Let's stop and say hi to the German announcers. Now, a slight spoiler here. We sure did. <laughs> slight spoiler. We started the show with the main event. It's a long story. I don't know if you want to talk about it, but we watched the main event first and then went back and watched everything else. The main event was very much a Chris Jericho WWE main event on an AEW show. So we watched that. Then we came back to the beginning and watched Gold Dust and Jack Swagger. And then we have the German announcers talking. This was a WWE show up to this point. Yeah. Sammy- hey, listen, it's nice to acknowledge that there are announcers from other countries, mm-hmm. but like get in, get out. I don't need I don't need to see them like in the WWE where they go through eighty five announced teams, they all say something in a foreign language. Yeah. You're like, fuck, this show's gonna be four and a half hours long and yes. every single one of these guys is saying hi in a foreign language. Well, I- like I get it. You got a lot of announcers and you're in a lot of countries. This does bring up another point. Because the show went long, longer than we expected, and uh, we did not start watching the first 90% of it until much later than we thought. So I was really looking for things that could have been cut to make the show show shorter. And talking to the German announcers for two minutes could have been cut. So Sammy Guevara versus Darby Allen on paper, sounds like a perfect opener. 
A guy who's already established as a star in Darby Allen, who the crowd loves, making this big return. Two small, fast guys who do a bunch of cool moves. This would have been a good opener. Except the way it was put together, they brawled for like 10 minutes before the match started. And they were already doing table spots and a hundred other things. So uh, given all of that, I understand why it was not the opener. But I think just having these guys go out there to start the show with a wrestling match would have been a better idea than what they did with either of these two matches, in fact. Well, there's a problem, Vinny. One guy tried to kill the other guy with a skateboard. That did happen. We're not going out there to do a wrestling match. This this crazy guy with half a skull on his face, he's pissed off and he still can't talk, apparently. So he's going out there to beat some ass. That's what he did. There was no lockup. No. There no. wasn't even ring intros. Or there was ring intros, but like... He ran down, or he skated, skated down. down. He leaped in the ring, and he just ran and dove through the ropes with a tope, shotgun drop kick, and they start beating the shit out of each other. Great. It was great. We also had, uh, when you said one guy killed the other with a skateboard, I thought you meant on this show. When no. Sammy picked up Darby's skateboard and whipped it across space into his head. Actually, yeah, he just tossed it right into the guy's head. Really hard. That looked like it sucked. Somebody I saw had a gif of it in half speed. It still looked terribly nasty, but at least in half speed, you could see Darby did get a hand up. So great execution by these men. So the actual match of this only went like four minutes. They were out there fighting for closer to 15. But uh, they start doing some stuff. Darby is... is it, it's It's funny because... The big spot in the pre-match brawl is Sammy doing a 6.30 senton to put Darby through a table, and then the bell rings. So if you're going to do all this stuff before the match, I would think the idea would be now you have the guy, the underdogs coming to this for revenge. Now he's already starting at a disadvantage. Instead, Darby takes over and immediately begins to tie him in knots. So I don't know what the point of any of this pre-match stuff was, really. Well, Vinny, the point of it was, if you ring the bell... All of this stuff that they did is DQ City. You can't put a guy on a table and do a 630 with a half twist off the post and put this guy through a table. That's a dis- fucking disqualification. So they did all of the crazy stuff, throwing a skateboard and the 630 and all of that stuff. They did all of that stuff. Plus, there's no count out because the bell hadn't started. They do all that stuff. They get out of the way. Then they get in the ring and they wrestle for the rest of it. That's why that happened. Yeah. Now, the part where Darby's in the top rope and Sammy comes running up and they tease several falls to the left, to the right, to the back, to the front. I'm like 90% sure that they were in complete control the entire time, but it looked terrifying. That is A-plus stuff right there. Sammy hits a big Spanish fly for two. He exposes a turnbuckle, but then he is the one who gets monkey flipped into it, which is awesome. And then Darby follows with his flipping stunner and the coffin drop for the win. The place for the last 10 seconds just went hog wild, which is the whole idea of pro wrestling, to have them pop at the finish. And uh, this match did, in fact, peak at the right time. And then Darby, of course, he has won the wrestling match, but he wants revenge. So he preps to do something dastardly to Sammy, but Jake Hager runs out and pulls his friend to safety before uh, Darby can do anything. So this feud must continue. But this was a win. Well, the babyface won, but it must continue because even though the babyface won the match, he did not get his revenge. Mm -hmm. So you don't always have to have the heel winning the first match. I mean, the story here isn't even about who wins or loses. The story of the match is Sammy tried to kill Darby. Darby wants to get his revenge. So they had a match. Darby beat the guy. But then when he goes to kill the guy, the guy gets dragged away, and Darby does not get the satisfaction of getting his revenge. All he got was a three count. Like, he beat the hell out of the guy, but he wanted to finish the guy off. He couldn't do it. So I liked it. It's one of those matches where... This match was so fucking much fun that both guys got over. Oh, absolutely. There, there yeah. was no winner, no loser. I mean, you know, Darby was a winner, but it's not like anybody was hurt by by losing this match. No. And more importantly, like when it's over, you really wanted to see them do the match again. Amen. Amen. So then, it is time to discuss the Young Bucks versus Hangman Page and Kenny Omega. If this turns out to be a four-hour podcast, this match is why. Dude, I wrote so many words for this. Match. I believe, let's see, almost an entire full page of notes. It did go a half hour, but I'm going to talk about the pre-match first. Dude, I wrote over a page. They did a music video for this, which is the, the music for which was a, a blatant, flagrant, unapologetic ripoff of Paper Cup by Linkin Park. But that's fine. 
it recaps in just a couple of minutes the build for this entire match, and it makes you realize the build for this match has been absolutely out of this world unbelievable. Because all four men are realistic, believable, authentic characters. I felt sympathy for each of the four individuals for entirely different reasons coming into this match. There's the intros. The Young Bucks were roundly booed during the intros. There's polite cheers for or polite applause, I should say, for Kenny and cheers for Hangman Page. So Omega starts. He does some stuff with the Bucks and it's it's whatever. They did some gimmick. They gave the crowd gizmos, like light up things in their wrists. They were they were wristbands. They were LED wristbands that, I guess, everybody for their ring entrance, the wristbands would be color coded to the entrances. Yes, but but synced up by section. Yes. So you have effective waves going left to right or back and forth. It was awesome. A great idea and execution. So, Hangman Page finally tags in. This is the biggest star in the entire show. This is a bigger star than Moxley. This is a bigger star than Jericho. He's just beloved. So they wrestled around for a while. When Nick Jackson and Kenny had a stalemate, they shook hands and both tagged out. When Matt Jackson and Hangman had a stalemate, Matt offered a handshake. But Hangman spat in his face. Oh. So this naturally started a brawl. They have this big, giant brawl on the floor. Nick has to pull Matt off of Hangman Page. But then, when Nick's in the ring, Hangman slaps the piss out of him. Now Nick's pissed off. He is on the same page with Matt. And as he tags Matt in for some double teams, you can hear Matt shout, I told you! Because now they both think Hangman's an asshole. For a while here, they are totally playing the heel team. Page eventually is able to tag out, but as he walks over... Kenny's got his hand out for the tag, but Kenny ignores that. He basically chops him in the shoulder and scolds him and orders him to attack and uh, demands he be aggressive. So Kenny does. They, They continue for a while. They brawl for a bit. The Bucks are on the floor. Hangman tries to do something out there. I think he's going to go for a pile driver through a table or a power bomb through a table. Either way, Omega stops him, pulls him off, and shouts, in ring, in ring. Because Kenny is all about, you know, this is a this is a competitive sporting thank event. You, thank you. It's an intense competition. Hangman's a crazy guy that wants to kill these dudes. Yes, we're not trying to. We'll, we'll fight them cleanly in the ring, not viciously on the floor. So there's a long bit where Kenny keeps trying and failing to hit the Terminator dive. They find a different way to cut him off every time. I don't think he ever hit it. He may have. A lot happened here. There's a long heat segment on Kenny to set up another Adam Page hot tag, and it's a great hot tag when he finally gets in there. He is just killing them both. He turns Nick inside out with a lariat. And then rather than make a cover, he throws Nick into the Bucks corner and demands Matt tag in for some ass kicking. So Matt tags in. They do some stuff. Matt just about killed on a German suplex where he lands on his head. Nick comes back, hits a million kicks, a bunch of other, as I wrote here, a million kicks and other cool shit. I sound like Granny now. So now Pace has been double teamed to, to death. He's hanging by a thread. And the Bucks are fighting to, to finish him off and to keep Kenny out of the ring. Not just to make a tag, but to stop him from breaking up moves. And th- this, I believe, is the point where the Bucks were in the ring for like five minutes straight. They did this spot where there's a million spots in this match, but this one there in were. particular. Yeah. Nick is going to do a springboard into the ring. But Hangman shoves him, and Nick just starts flying off into the ether. I thought, oh my god, he's going to die. But I didn't realize it was on the side where the ramp was. So Nick basically does a backflip off the top after he gets shoved. He lands on the ground. He vaults back into the ring into a Canadian Destroyer. Yes. That spot was so awesome. I know what you're talking about, and I don't think I wrote it down because there's so many other things going on, but yes, it was. So there was a trend in the show of guys making references to wrestlers from other promotions. Now, part of that here, of course, is Kenny and, and, and you know the, the Golden Lovers will always be a thing, whether they're working for the same company or not. So there's a lot of Kota Ibushi spots in this match. Later, Cody did Randy Orton's pose and tried the draping DDT. 
That's right. Hangman did the Marty Squirrel chicken Hangman wing. Hangman did the Marty Squirrel chicken wing. Complete with the pose, the, the twirl, the, the splits, and the shout chicken wing. Yes. So there's something going on with this because there was too much of it to just be a coincidence. Nah, they just do it. Because yeah. you never know what's going to happen. I guess not. There's you never know what's going to happen. Maybe. So if you keep the story going, yeah, if down the something road. ever happens and Squirrel shows up or AEW and New, and New Japan work together or AEW and Ring of Honor work together, yeah. you continue on. Yes. And it seems like, oh my God, this whole thing has just been worked out the entire time. And if nothing happens, then, oh well, you did something fun to this crowd. Again. But here's the thing. This isn't WWE, dude. Like... It's not like these guys never work for New Japan. Right. It's not like Kenny Omega never teamed with Kota Bushi. Mm-hmm. Like, it's all part of history. Yes. So you do stuff in the promotion. It doesn't necessarily mean like, you know, in the old days or in WWE, it's like, well, you're never going to do something referencing TNA unless you like just hired somebody from TNA and they're going to come in. Mm-hmm. doesn't have to be like that yes. in AEW. You're just referencing shit that happened in wrestling. No, I agree. And the other part of it is that AEW fans are not WWE fans. If you're watching AEW, odds are you know who Kota Ibushi and Marty Skrull are, and what the history of is history is with guys like Hangman Page and Kenny Omega. Yes, so. but at the same time, if you have no idea what's going on, it's not like you couldn't get this match. No. It's not like I couldn't show this match to somebody who's been watching wrestling for six months, and they wouldn't just think it was a fabulous, of course not, astonishingly great match. But these things we're talking about. The here. more you pay attention. The more you get out of the match. Yes, that's a good point. But yeah, if you don't know what's going on, it's 15 seconds of stuff in a 30-minute match. Who cares? So, Kenny starts running a while with V-triggers and Snapdragons and his underhook pile driver, and then Nick Jackson ends his life with an avalanche poison rama, rana. I'm screaming in terror at this point. Matt takes... Hangman outside does the rolling northern lights on the ramp, which is notable because the ramp is not totally flat. He's doing these uphill. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's impressive. Then they lay Hangman out with the Indy Taker on the ramp. He's dead. They've killed him. It's a springboard into a spike tombstone on the ramp. No more Hangman page. And as soon as they hit it, the Bucks are like, what have we just done? Have we gone too far? This is a some fucked up shit here. But the match continues. They get in the ring. Matt practically has to order Nick to start the super kick part. Nick's still, like, still reluctant and guilty about what they've done to their friend Hangman. Hey but there's still a match continues. So eventually they start kicking the hell out of Omega. <laughs> they grab him. They hit the golden trigger. They shout golden trigger. They hit the double knee strike just like Ibushi and Omega. And they could cover. And Omega is so pissed they stole the Golden Lovers movie. Kicks out at one. It's awesome. Now Matt's had enough. We're 20 plus minutes in. That's almost 30 minutes in this match at this point. Matt's tried everything. He's frustrated. Hangman's being a dick. Omega won't die. Omega's shoulder's all taped up after being in the brutalizer in the brutal match with Pac just four days ago on Dynamite. So Matt starts tearing off the tape, the Kinesio tape on the shoulder. This pisses Nick off. Nick pulls Matt off for like the second or third time in this match. And Matt gets that look where he looks in his hands, looks at the tape in his hands, and says, Jesus Christ, what am I doing? They go over the Meltzer driver. It's been several minutes now. Paige revives from the dead to break that up. Pulls Nick off the apron, puts him through another table. The champs at the buckshot V-trigger combo, which is still not the finish. Kenny goes to the one-winged angel. He can't get it because his shoulder's fucked up. So Paige tags in, carries the load for his partner. He hits the one-winged angel, but it's not his finish, so it doesn't end the match. Nick broke it up. Nick broke it up. Who he had powerbombed through a table. Yes, but then Nick is thrown outside. Kenny does a buckshot from out of the ring onto the ramp. Larry, it's Nick. Does another buckshot from the ramp into the ring. Larry, it's Matt. He finally wins just past the half-hour mark. And uh, it's been 24 hours now, and I remain confident this is the best tag team match I ever saw. If you just want to see four guys doing cool moves, I give you 30-plus minutes of four guys doing cool moves. If you want to see great storytelling, my God, the storytelling in this match. Four distinct personalities with four different motivations, all reacting the way normal people would to, to, to different situations. This is set up so well. We'll talk about the post-match in a minute. This was all set up and told so well that you could have any one of these guys turn on any of the others, and it would have immediately made sense. If, if the, 
the other crew had turned on Paige, that would have made sense. If Paige had turned on Omega or turned on the Bucks, it would have made sense. If Omega had turned on the Bucks, it would have made sense. If Matt had turned on Nick, while it would be a terrible idea, it would have made sense. This was phenomenal storytelling. This was phenomenal athleticism. This was great action. This was intense. This was paced well. Here's the real key. This thing went just over 30 minutes. At no point, not one time ever, did I think to myself, this is starting to drag. This is starting to go too long. This peaked a few minutes ago. No, none of that. This was a 30-minute match that used all 30 minutes and used them well. I can't say enough great things about this. So whenever people say this was the greatest tag team match I've ever seen, the greatest tag team match of all time, as soon as I hear things like that, immediately your first thought is, the best of all time. But then you start thinking about it, like I did yesterday, and I thought, well, what was better? (laughs) This is the key. I mean, if you want to argue it, what was better? And over the last day, you know, Crazy people have gotten way too crazy about this. And, oh, this match was better than this, blah, blah, blah. Hey, listen, everybody. Like, fuck off. It's one of the best matches of all time. If you don't think it was the best, fine. Like, it's it's everybody's opinion. But don't even come on here. Like, don't even, like, uh, block me from your Twitter or whatever. Don't even try to come on here and tell me that this wasn't one of the greatest matches of all time. This was a, th- I'll give you the exact time. It was 30 minutes and 56 seconds, okay? It was maybe five minutes into a 30-minute and 56-second match. But I'm sitting here watching this going, if I have to hear one motherfucker tell me that these guys have no psychology, like, I don't even know what I'm going to do. Oh, yeah. This this was one of the most psychologically packed matches I think I ever have seen. It may have been the most psychologically packed match I've ever seen in my entire life. Like, I can't say that every single solitary move, like, you know, they always go, well, every every move meant something, okay? Normally, when you say every move meant something, this would be like one of those Undertaker Triple H matches where if you actually look at it, there was like five minutes worth of moves that they stretched out to 25 minutes, so they would do a move that meant something, and then they'd sell for five minutes, and then they'd get up, and they'd do a switch in another move that meant something, and they'd sell for five minutes. So you could say, yeah, every single move in this match meant something. Well, yeah, there was only 13 moves in the match, okay? I'm not a, you know, it's not about moves, but, I mean, it's 2020, and this audience wants to see fucking moves. That's true. And so there was, like, a thousand moves in this match, and of the 1,000 moves, probably 800 of the 1,000. And quite frankly, I mean, every every review I read of this match, every comment I see uh, on, on Twitter or on our board or on, on YouTube when we talked about this, like, somebody figures out something else that nobody else saw yes. that makes sense into the match. So it is possible that every move of the 1,000 moves actually had a point to these four guys. And we've only figured out 800 of them. That's true. But, I mean, just packed to the brim with psychology, packed to the brim with, like, fantastic execution of all of these moves. It was just unbelievable. It was, in fact, if you want to argue, it wasn't number one. Like, knock yourself out. I don't give a shit. It's one of the greatest tag matches I've ever seen. Probably was the greatest tag match I have ever seen. And if it wasn't, it was one of the greatest tag team matches I've ever seen. And, like, if you don't agree with that, I just don't know what to tell you. I, I, I honestly, I just, I, I don't know what to tell you. Watch some other sport. Exactly. This is, this is not the, your interest. This is, this is not the sport for you. Or watch anime or something. I don't know. I mean, really, it really, it's not, it is not the sport for you anymore if you didn't think that this was a great match. Like, what you need to do is just take your WWE Network subscription and just watch all the old stuff. And watch all of the old stuff on New Japan World and uh, for all Japan and whatever. Just just stay in the past. And I'm not burying you. Like, knock yourself out. If you're happy watching all of the great stuff from the past, like, do it. Yes. Just do it and leave me alone and leave everybody else alone that wants to enjoy wrestling in 2020. That's it. Yes. Now, there is more. Several minutes 
<laughs> it's just so awesome. Several minutes after everyone recuperates, the Bucks, in defeat, are the first ones to be man enough to congratulate the winners and also, in a way, apologize for losing their temper, maybe crossing the line. Omega's been friends with these Bucks for a long time, but they pulled some shit in this match. And he is very, very reluctant. But eventually he accepts. And they're standing on one side of the ring. Kenny Omega, Nick Jackson, Matt Jackson. Hangman Page is on the other side of the ring. His back is to them. Now what happens is he very, very slowly turns to face them, takes a deep breath, and then slowly turns and leaves the ring. Now everyone... It's going to talk about what happened next as far as teased turns that didn't turn anything. I would have bet a thousand dollars that when Hangman did the slow turn, they were going to triple super kick him and lay him out. They were in the perfect position for it, and it would have made total sense. But it didn't happen. Kenny or uh, Hangman just leaves the ring, and then he turns and he sees the Bucks go to either side, and he sees Omega turn his back, and Hangman drops that belt. And Hangman drops that top rope. I may have been the only one who thought a triple super kick was coming. Everyone watching the show, including all the announcers, thought Hangman was about to drop Omega, his tag team partner, with a buckshot. He's got his hands in the perfect position. He's braced to jump. He's just waiting for Kenny to turn around. And then Kenny turns around, and he sees Hangman. Hangman hasn't moved. He's still in launch position. And he stops and says, let's go. <laughs> and Kenny goes with him. So in the end, here's the most amazing thing about this. This story is exactly where it was coming into the show. There's still tension between all four dudes. The title didn't change hands. We just had an unbelievably awesome match in the middle. And nothing has actually changed. But God, it was great. This is just the best segment ever. And what I also loved about it, Besides how awesome Hangman was to just not even... It's not even like he got out of position. He just stood in that position yes. and just beckoned him. He never... It's not like he... It's not like he got caught. He didn't get caught, and he didn't change his mind. He was never going to jump. We but don't he think. But, well... We don't know. And that's the key. Because the other great thing about this was all three announcers said, like, everything you were thinking as a fan. Yes. They didn't say a bunch of stupid horse shit. They didn't pretend like they didn't saw it. Yes. They, did, they didn't build it up into being something more than it was. It was just like, someone said, was that what I think it was? And then someone else said, I don't know, but I think it was. That's the whole point. Like, no one knows. Yes. They don't know, but they're not playing stupid. They're playing us. It was great. It was a masterpiece. So, unfortunately, life goes on, the show goes on, and... This was not a masterpiece. I thought the show, at this point, nosedived hard. Chris Statlander versus Nyla Rose. So, Excalibur's line during the intros is, and this is a quote, Statlander, unused, un unused to Earth's atmosphere, battling severe fever and flu all week. Yeah. Shivani and Ross were not impressed by this line. But Excalibur stuck to his guns. So these women were sent out here to die. They had to follow the best tag team match maybe we've ever seen. They were sent out here to just do their best, but they were sent out there to, to, to die before the crowd, and they seemed eminently capable of dying before this crowd. You know what I like about this Statlander thing, though, is Excalibur, as an announcer, is the guy who's playing along. And so if you happen to be a Chris Statlander fan and you like the idea that she's an alien, he's your guy. He's going to let you pretend she's an alien. Yes, he, he's in on the joke. But the other two announcers are making it abundantly clear to you that she's not a goddamn alien. No. She's got a stupid gimmick, and they don't want to hear about it. <laughs> yes. So, great. It's perfect. Because there's two kinds of fans. There's the kind that like the Statlander deal, and there's the kind that think it fucking sucks. So no matter what side of the fence you're on, you got an announcer in your, on your side. So it turns out Chris Statlander and Nyla Rose are not as good at wrestling as Kenny Omega, Hangman Page, and the Young Bucks, nor as they are they as good at wrestling as pretty much any woman you would ever see on an NXT show. 
Every single thing they did looked rehearsed and unnatural. I not for one minute believed I was watching a legitimate competition. It was your average bad match for a while. Then the announcers get bored. They start talking about C2E2. Talking about what an exciting night this has already been. Talking about whatever they can talk about besides this actual match. So I checked out for a long time. I'm tweeting. I'm Facebook and whatever. And I, I look up and I realize this match is still going on. This match went 12 minutes and 45 seconds. It was way too long. Statlander legit was coming off flu and fever and everything like that. So, you know, I, I wouldn't judge her on this match because she probably still felt like shit and was weak. I mean, she fell down on a kip-up, which she probably has never done one time in her career. Which, by the way, the audience applauded when she stood back up afterwards because they were just they were dying to try to like this. And Nyla, like, she can be carried to a great match, we saw as her. we saw with Riho. Yes, yes. But, I mean, the reality is she's not Riho. Statlander isn't Riho. And the AW Women's Division, I mean, the best thing about it was Riho having matches. And now Riho is not the champion. And so, this is what you're going to get until a great worker beats Nyla. Well, first of all... This is what you're going to get. They don't... Again, we came into the show with me looking for things that went too long. This! This went too long. This went probably eight minutes too long. And it just kept going. This got the same amount of time as Pock and Orange Cassidy. That is appalling. Yes. That is a crime. This kept going and going, and the longer it went, the worse it got. Then they started doing near falls. Like, oh my god, just end this thing. And then the last minute, how many times did one or both of these women almost die? Well, falling off the top rope, falling their legs, their necks, their heads. Nyla wanted to do a beast bomb, but she didn't have her legs on the inside. She had her legs on the outside. Oh, that's right. She almost tripped on the very finish. So she, she almost had tripped, killed her. If she, she would have killed her, she would have landed. Yes, yes, on her neck and killed her. She managed to get one leg in, but only one. And then they both fell down, and nobody died, and it was over. Okay, so here's the thing. For people who say, well, Vinny, she was sick. What do you expect? Okay, if she's that sick, cancel the match. You will do zero refunds if you cancel Chris Statlander versus Nyla Rose. If you're going to do the match, don't book it to go 12-plus minutes. And if you must do the match, and you must book it to go 12-plus minutes, once you realize, holy shit, look at this. We have to end this now. Call an audible. End this. Get it off my TV. I thought this was horrible. I thought it was a horrible, horrible match. I thought it was bad. I do not think it was one of the worst matches I've ever seen. It was one of the worst matches I've seen in 2020. Well, I have to think about that. You don't watch much SmackDown and Raw. <laughs> no, I watch pay-per-views, which are supposed to be significantly better. And then... Cody versus MJF. Cody's band was significantly worse than Nyla Rose and Chris Statlander. Oh, my God. You know what you... you, you oh, I actually did see because we watched it afterwards, but uh, it was bad as I thought this was. We watched the Jericho match first, but we started when they were brawling in the crowd. That's yeah. when we got on live. Yes, yes. So later we went back and we watched all the way to that point. So it wasn't until right at the end of the night that we saw... The inner circle choir. The last thing I saw was Jericho's perform, entrance. <laughs> perform Judas. Yes. Which is even better. Yes. So, man, as much as I hated this downstate's performance, fuck. Once I saw the inner circle choir, that made this even worse. Yes. The funny thing is, you know what it, you know what it reminds me of? And, and people are going to be flabbergasted that I make, like, this reference. But... You ever heard Mother by Danzig? Of course. That fucking song is awesome. Sure. Have you ever heard him perform that live? Not as good. Oh, my fucking Lord Almighty. Like, you'd be saying Downstate was the Beatles if you fucking heard Danzig perform that song live. But I remember when I was a kid, it was like, I got the live CD because I loved that song. Mm -hmm. And I heard him perform that, and I was like, there's no way it's the same guy. Like, what? How? Well... I think Cody's theme song, like the recorded version, I think it's great. It's perfect for Cody. The fans love it. But my God, they came out to perform this song live. And I think it was even worse than when Hunter had, uh, who the fuck was it? The DX band? No. Motorhead. Motorhead came out to do oh! a song, and oh! they didn't know the words. This is, uh, uh, listen, no, 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 no. <laughs> this they didn't was... know the words. 
He's just going, ah, ah. Let he's me, making up sounds. Let me kill my sister mumbling anything was way better than downstate. I don't know about that. Oh, oh, well, I'm going to call my metal friends. We're going to get on you for this one. Dude, I didn't say anything bad about Motorhead. I said, when you're doing the live performance and you can't remember the fucking words, Motorhead, so you're just mumbling, that's Motor- bad, Vinny. Motorhead without instruments would have been on the downstate. Oh, get out of here. But yeah, it was bad. And then, Cody's fucking tattoo. Well, I couldn't stop looking at it. I don't... That's the problem. I, Listen, we, yeah. you can get whatever goddamn tattoo you want anywhere, but this tattoo, new, on this day, was so goddamn distracting. That's all I could look at was that tattoo. Like, it, there's no way it's real. It is real. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, it's real. I'm just watching this match, and all I could do was look at this tat. It was distracting. Yes, Ken. Did you see Jack Gallagher's new tattoo? That was not as bad. I mean, it wasn't great. Are those legit as well? I think so, yeah. Okay. This yeah. is not a Hakushi deal, unfortunately. Yeah. Or a uh, Tensai. I got the impression, also, that Brandy was not a fan of this tattoo. That's yeah. what I've been led to believe as well. Yeah. Well, that's... Bad. I mean, they can be removed. That's between a man and his wife. That's... <laughs> I'm not getting in the middle of that one. I'm sure. I'm staying out of it. I'm sure when Cody sat down in that tattoo chair, he he was well aware that some people would like this tattoo more than other people. And I hope he, I sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, I hope he's happy with it. But yeah, I'm sure he is. It was very distracting. Yes. Now, this match, in a lot of ways, was great. A lot, in a lot of ways, it confused me. The Dream Wrestling match, first of, all, first of all, I just want to talk about MGF in general. We have said many times that Chris Jericho in AEW is a 1980s territorial heel in a 2020 world. MGF is the same thing, but he's from a different territory. MJF is an AWA heel. He's Larry Zabisco. He's Nick Bockwinkle. Jericho, I was trying to figure out who he would be. The best I could answer is like he's half Ric Flair, half the Freebirds. Sure. Very, very different 1980s heel characters, but they have that much in common. So they're doing this match, and MJF is running away a lot, hiding behind Wardlow a lot. At one point, he hides behind Wardlow, and Brandy walks up out of nowhere and throws a beer in Wardlow's face. He hadn't done anything to this point. He hadn't laid a finger on Cody. He hadn't menaced Arn. hadn't menaced Brandy. He's just standing there minding his own business. He strapped the shit out of her husband. Weeks ago. <laughs> Dude, she's pissed off about that. I didn't have a problem with that spot at all. So this is... If someone fucking whipped the shit out of me like that, I'd hope Whitney threw well, a beer in that fucker's face, too. Well, I have more to say about this, because Wardlow felt the same way you did. <laughs> he was angry. He went after Brandy, which was a distraction. There's a trap set by Cody and Brandy to distract Wardlow so Cody could wipe him out with a tope. Now I'm thinking, okay... They've done this. They've picked the fight with Wardlow. Now they've taken him out before he has a chance to interfere. And that made sense to me. But then two minutes later, Wardlow's interfering, working over Cody's arm at ringside. So what the fuck was the point of the beer and the tope? I was confused. The match continues. Cody in the moonsault off the top of the giant cage on impact. Or impact. Pardon me. I apologize from the bottom of my heart to everyone involved with all elite wrestling. Dynamite. Dynamite. Cody, from doing the giant moonsault off the giant cage, broke his toe. Eminently believable that this could happen. So, MJF begins to work the toe. He stomps in the toe. He tears the boot off, revealing Cody's hideous sock. He's still stomping the toe. He bites the toe. Then Cody makes his big comeback, knocks MJF to the apron, hits the disaster kick, the springboard roundhouse kick to the face, and MJF goes to the floor, and then there's some bullshit with Brandy and Wardlow and Arn to kill time. A minute passes. Oh, no, Vinny. Arn gets wiped out by Cody. That's later. Don't even think. No, that's what happened. But That's what happened before MJF came up bleeding. That was a rigmarole on the floor. Arn, Arn, uh, Brandy dove off onto Wardlow. Wardlow caught her. Cody says put her down. Arn pulls her to safety. Cody goes for the big boot. Wardlow moves. Cody hits Arn. Arn is dead. Okay, my my notes say that happened well after MGF came up, came up bleeding. I had MGF coming up bleeding right after that. But anyway, so War- MGF comes up bleeding. He was kicked with one kick by a bare foot or a sock. 
Or a fucking long toe. He's bleeding all over the place. I, I couldn't figure out why he was bleeding, but hey, you know what? I was very bad. Maybe the idea this. is that in a fight, sometimes you get cut open. I suppose. And it doesn't have to be something like a post. It doesn't necessarily have to be something like a whatever. He got booted. There was so much blood. By a bare foot and it's bleeding all I've, over the I, place. I see 10,000 kicks a year. I don't know why this one caused MGF's head to explode. So then later we do the spot where we have... Cody throws a kick at Wardlow. He misses. He wipes out Arn. This all leads to nothing. Arn doesn't... Well, leads to nothing now. I it guess. It will lead to something down the road. I suppose. But this all seemed to be a lot of stuff happening that didn't go anywhere. And I was just baffled well, by Well, Vinny, the whole point is everything doesn't have to go somewhere today. You were just praising the Young Bucks match with Hangman and, and, uh, and Kenny Omega based on storylines that they've been doing for years now. The Arn thing will pay off down the road. At some point. So then Cody makes his big comeback. Hits a low blow. Hits a cop killer. He takes off his wet weight belt. And he whips MJF with it as revenge for the strapping. The ref's trying to say, no, no, no. You can't do that. That's illegal. And so Cody says, one more. And the ref turns his back. And Cody hits one more and throws it away. So I guess the rules are, if you are an executive vice president with a company... You get preferential no, treatment. No, Vinny. So listen, I, th- I thought it was goofy, too, because the-, the reason I didn't like it is because the refs are always so incompetent in-, in AEW. If they weren't, I would have been fine with it one time. The whole thing is the MGF character is supposed to be so despicable that even the referee is like, this shithead deserves one more. I see. So he turned his back. I see. So at this point, Cody's hit most of his finishes. MJF's bleeding everywhere. Cody's kicked him in the balls repeatedly, whipped him a couple times. So they're trying. You know, the story here obviously is that Cody did everything he could to this, to everything he could do to this guy, except in the end, get the victory. So MJF is now begging for mercy. He's hugging Cody's feet. He drags himself up. Because Cody was man enough to take 10 straps, mm-hmm. but MJF takes two straps and he's crying. Sure. I can't take it anymore. That's fine. I'm begging off. That's fine. But then when MGF drags himself up and spits in Cody's face. So clearly he could take more. Because <laughs> he was a, he was not a beaten man yet. He was he was still defiant. Because he had the ring on. He had the ring in his trunks at this point. So Cody starts finally hitting his crossroads repeatedly. He has it twice. When he goes to the third one, MGF had time to put the ring on, hit the ring punch, and he gets the pin. So I get what they were doing. I get, I know what they were trying to do here. I think MJF was the. I never felt like MJF was a beaten man. They, they they were going for the same idea as Shawn Michaels and Undertaker Hell in a Cell, where the bad guy takes his beating but still gets the technical win at the end. And I never felt like MJF was beaten that badly. He needed to be on defense for like five straight minutes here to get that point across. So I'm nitpicking the fuck out of this. I realize this. I'm probably pissing off a lot of people, including perhaps MJF and Cody. And I don't blame you for being pissed off at me. This was a good match. I enjoyed it. There were a lot of things I wish they had done differently. Well, I mean, here's the thing. The I, I had an idea for the finish where we don't have time because we're running low on time, but basically it would have been uh, uh, MJF winning via DQ, Cody being the first DQ in AEW history. And they didn't do it. But at the end of the day, like they can still do that. I mean, the fact that MJF got the win in this match, there are a thousand things that they can do from here. And the reality was, with the strapping and everything else, like, it would have been very, very difficult for this to live up to that hype. And it's just a fact of the matter. It would have been very, very difficult for it to live up to that hype. I thought they did a good job. It wasn't, like, the best match on the show or anything like that. But they paid it off to a degree... And at the same time, it wasn't designed to pay the whole thing off. That's also true. Because there's more to come. Yes, Ken. Do you think these two are in war games? Hell yeah, you kidding me? They're probably the captains. So mm-hmm. who's the team? I don't know yet. Yeah, we'll find out soon. We got four, four weeks. weeks. Yeah. It'll be all the top feuds, I'm sure. Pack versus Orange Cassidy. We gotta get going here. All right. So if you've seen an Orange Cassidy match, a real one, a good or one. Or been in one. Or been in fair point. Uh you've seen Orange's stick. There it's it he's Orange Cassidy. It's awesome. I don't think you can be Orange Cassidy on every show, but if you save Orange Cassidy for the big shows, it's awesome. Pac is also awesome and the perfect guy to be in there with Orange Cassidy and make all of his stuff look good. And also, when it's time to beat him up, just beat the 
fuck out of him because Pac is awesome. So Orange does all this comedy. Pac lets him do all the silliness and then kills him for a while. And then Orange really runs wild, and he's actually a very, very, very good pro wrestler. So when he finally does his offense, it looks awesome. The place is just going crazy. He did the best Superman punch in this match. Like, oh my god, actual Superman wouldn't have done it as good. Yes. The whole building is standing as he goes. For, he goes up to the top rope and gets cut off. He hits an avalanche DDT. He hits a diving DDT. But before he can finish him. Pac rolls out of the ring, which is important because earlier when Pac was trying to finish Orange with a black arrow, Orange spent several minutes just rolling back and forth like a goof. So now Pac is using Orange's own medicine against him. So Trent is involved. I believe he threw Pac back into the ring. This drew the Lucha Brothers out. There's a big brawl with the best friends in the Lucha Brothers. Orange was distracted. He turned around. Pac caught him in the uh, brutalizer for the submission. This was an excellent wrestling match. Yeah, so obviously, very quickly, I mean, if you only see Orange Cassidy, if, if the only Orange Cassidy you've ever seen is a bunch of gifts on Twitter, then you're probably flabbergasted here. If you've ever watched Orange Cassidy, this was Orange Cassidy. And he did, it was Orange Cassidy's greatest hits. Yes. Uh, the one main difference is that he didn't do, he didn't win. And so often in the Orange Cassidy match when he wins, it's because somebody hits him with a big move, but they somehow manage to get themselves pinned. Like, I think the Filthy Tom match, he hit Orange Cassidy with the Styles Clash and managed to pin himself upon the landing. Impressive. So we're still waiting. The first Orange Cassidy win is going to be something like that. It's going to be awesome. But the formula is simple, and the funniest thing about people getting mad about it is... The old school people that got mad about Orange Cassidy, I guarantee they never watched an actual Orange Cassidy match. And the irony is, this got probably the second biggest reaction of anything on the entire show. I thought it was the second best match in the show. Getting the most out yes. of very little. Uh, from the, but from, it wasn't like it was a lazy match. No, God, It's no. not like they didn't do anything. No. They fucking worked their asses off. But they got the crowd going crazy without fucking killing each other. That's pro wrestling. On the very first time I saw Orange Cassidy, I said to myself, this is one of the smartest wrestlers I've ever seen as far as getting the maximum reaction. But he can go. But he, but he can go. Getting the maximum reaction after doing minimum stuff. So, yes, giant thumbs up for I that. I wonder what the fucking Patriots thinking right now. And then Chris Jericho versus John Moxley. They had a very, very good WWE pay-per-view main event here. Basically, there was crowd brawling. There was lots of interference. A lot of hardcore spots. There's a... I'm not sure exactly how Moxley started bleeding, but he I, it was from his nose. I eventually figured it out, but he was on his back as his nose was bleeding, and it looked like he was bleeding from the bad eye. Oh, no, it was, it was above his eye. That's right. They later showed it was above his eye. But uh, the point is, I thought it was blood coming He was posted. Out. He was posted, and he, he was cut up just above the eye and bleeding everywhere. You know, great visual. So there's lots and lots of interference. Eventually... Hager and Proud and Powerful are all out there. Hager is caught punching Moxley. And now it is time for Aubrey to have her time in the sun. And she's over. And the crowd loves her. And she's a great ref. She did the best ejection of all the heels. She's hopping on one foot. up. Someone said she used to do ballet. You can tell. She does a spinning 360 ejection. Ortiz takes a giant bump for the ejection. It's awesome. So they're all thrown out. The match continues for a while, it, and it was, it was to the point, this was such a WWE match, the crowd, was, it's not like they were dead, but they came way more into it after the ejection. It's like they all knew this match is not ending until these fuckers get thrown out, then something will happen. So they keep going for a while. Mox gigs himself more under the guise of adjusting his eye patch, which was awesome. Eventually, Jericho gouges that good eye. He digs his fingers in there, tries to pull it out. And now Mox is totally blind. He can't see anything. And Jericho's very confident. He's shadow boxing. He's taunting him. He thinks he's got this fucker now. And he preps for that Judas effect. And he's signaling. He's tapping his elbow. He's going to take this guy's head off. And he comes out, spins around for the back elbow, and Moxley ducks it. He ducks another strike. He grabs Jericho. Here's the paradigm shift. And everyone's thinking, what's going on? How'd this happen? And then Moxley pulls that eye patch off, and his eye is fine. He's been playing positive for weeks now, and Jericho fell into his trap. And once they revealed this, obviously Moxley had to win, and he did. He grabbed Jericho. They called it the paradigm shift. Really, this was the Death Rider. 
He grabbed him by the arms, lifted him up, dropped him on his head for the win. John Moxley, your new AEW World Champion, a very good pay per view main event. And among my favorite things here, he does a post match promo. He curses because he, as he admits, he's making this up as he goes along. It's a great babyface promo about thanking the fans and being grat- grateful for AEW. And the show ends, his music's playing, his partying, and they put up a graphic. John Moxley, AEW champion, career singles record 12 0 1. Because the champion wins all the damn time. What a novel concept. Dude, the guy that everybody compared Moxley to or Dean Ambrose was, oh, he can be the next Steve Austin. Oh, he can be the next Steve Austin. He was nowhere in the stratosphere of ever being the next Steve Austin when he was in WWE. Oh, God, no. Now it's been four months or whatever, and this fucking guy, he's not... Listen, he's not Steve Austin, okay? But if you watch what they do with John Moxley, he's Steve Austin. He goes in there... He's the badass. Mm-hmm. He's 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 not a heel, but like he's the loner. He's the guy on his own. Every single heel tried to screw him in this match, and they could never succeed. Yes, no matter what they tried, they could never. And they got stuff on him. It's not like he totally thwarted them. No, like they they he overcame it. Yeah, they they distracted they him. They hit him with a mad ball. Yeah, and they kicked dis- out. They distract him. Jericho hits a movie, kicks out. They yes. distract him. Jericho hits a movie, kicks out. Finally. The heels get caught, they get ejected. And then, the big story at the end is the fucking baby face outsmarted yes. the heel. Yes. Now, the one thing I would have done differently, and I don't even know if it would have been better, but I was just thinking, if this were Stone Cold Steve Austin, okay, and the heel goes for his big finish, and Austin ducks because he can, in fact, see and he reveals the eye patch that he can see, he could do the double big bird, boot, stunner, one, two, three. Fucking great finish, okay? But Moxie doesn't use the stunner. He uses the double arm DDT. And for some reason, there's something about the way that move is done that when I watched this match, I thought that he should have ducked the Judas effect, revealed that he can see, Jericho's like, fuck! Moxley beats the shit out of him for like 30 seconds, then boot and hits the move and pins him. One way or the other, it doesn't matter. The way they did the finish, like Jericho can, you know, he can use the excuse that I was I was surprised I was caught off guard. I let my guard down for a split second. I got beaten, set up a rematch that way or whatever. But the fans went fucking nuts for the finish. It was another one of those things. This was not to the degree of the tag match because the tag match was 30 minutes and they did like a thousand more moves in this match but this was one of those matches where everything in this match they it played into something prior to the storyline the eye patch thing paid off there at the end the the heel outsmarted the baby face it was a perfect finish moxie's promo afterwards was fucking great attention to detail if you're if you're an aw fan like the match I mean, the match, everything played into all of the stories you've been watching. This was just, it was it was a very, very good main event. I can't say it was a great main event, but it was a very, very good main event. It was a well-thought-out main event. It it rewarded you for being a viewer. It sent you fucking home happy. Yes. Which we never see in the other company. And I thought it was really good stuff. So there you go. That's the show. Giant thumbs up for EW Revolution. Fucking wish we had more time, everybody, but you are totally out of time. So I got to wrap it up here. We can talk more about this on Observer Live tomorrow.